I studied abroad in Peru when I was 19. This was quite a few years ago, so the story is a bit foggy. A lot of the time, I was the only white person around, so I stuck out. I would often get whistles and catcalls, but I think this guy was up to something more malicious. I was on a bus to one of the other neighborhoods, a route I had taken maybe once or twice by myself at that point. A man who looked to be in his 60s got on the bus, scanned the seats, then headed straight to the seat beside me. He was also white and wearing a baseball hat and t-shirt. He sat down and asked in English if I was American. I said yes and asked him where he was from. I actually didn't care and didn't want to talk to him, but I used to be polite. Anyway, he said he was from Lima, but he liked to learn languages. At some point he asked me where I was going, and I told him the neighborhood, but not the exact stop. He told me that he could read palms, so I said great and flipped mine up. He said that he didn't do readings for free. He told me that I could trade him English lessons for palm readings. I wanted all interaction with this guy to end ASAP, so there was no way I was going to give him lessons. I just told him he was already good at English. He grabbed one of my wrists and flipped my palm up. He told me that it was very interesting and that I really needed to know, but he would only tell me for English lessons. He asked for my phone number, so I lied and told him that I didn't have a phone yet in Peru. But he could give me his number, and I'll call him when I get one. He didn't like that idea. He really wanted to be able to contact me himself. He hesitantly pulled out a piece of paper and wrote his number down. He wrote his name as Cholo. I read it and asked, Cholo? In Peru, that word is often used to refer to a person from the mountains, and is sometimes derogatory. This guy was definitely not a Cholo. He was a white guy from the city. Well, he told me that I could just call him Cholo, brushing it off and said I didn't need to know his real name. I was very freaked out, but I didn't want to cause a scene. He told me that he was concerned I was lying and would not call him. He said that it had happened before when he asked a woman from India to give him lessons and it didn't work out. He said he would hate for what happened to her to happen to me. At this point, my skin was crawling. I was panicking, but I still did not want to draw attention to myself. I realized that no one else on the bus knew what was going on. We'd been speaking in English the entire time. With as much sincerity that I could muster, I told him I would call him. He told me he didn't believe me because I wasn't looking at him. Then he grabbed my face and turned my head toward him. He had his hand wrapped around my jaw and was holding on firmly. I said I would call him, and he let go. We weren't close to my stop, but I told him I had to go. I started to stand up, but he pushed my legs back down and told me we weren't there yet. So I sat down and was scared he would try to follow me, or that he wouldn't let me off. He kept his arm over my legs to stop me from standing up. As soon as we were in the neighborhood, I got off the bus. He didn't follow me, thank God. So that's the unsatisfying end of this story. That was the first or last time I saw or heard from him. I threw away the paper with his number, thinking that I didn't want it and didn't need it. I wish I had given the information to the police. I don't know what his plans were, and I do not want to find out. This happened in Thailand in 2014. I had lost my job in Zurich and decided to use the opportunity to make a trip around the world, starting with Southeast Asia. I've always wanted to work with animals, so after backpacking Vietnam and parts of Thailand, I applied for a volunteer position at an ape sanctuary. They told me I could start whenever I wanted. The deal was that I had to make a deposit around 20,000 baht. They told me if I stayed at least three months, I would get 70% of my money back. The early days of working there were wonderful. The place was full of young, motivated people who thought they could save the world, one ape at a time. The majority of the animals were rescued gibbons. Our goal was to nurse them back to health and eventually release them back into the wild. 
Our responsibilities as volunteers were to feed them, clean their cages, and educate visiting tourists about the horrors of the illegal pet trade in Thailand. Before they came to us, most of the gibbons had been abused as tourist attractions. You know those pictures you see on Facebook of people being on vacation somewhere in Asia, where they hold cute animals into the camera? This is how the poachers make their money. They will put a gibbon, lizard, or slow loris on your shoulder, snap a picture, and charge you for it afterwards. I can tell you that every single one of those animals has been through hell, and was or will be killed soon after the photo was taken. The thing is, poachers can only use the babies as tourist attractions, because as soon as they reach puberty, they become territorial and aggressive and are then no longer of use to them. On average, to get a single baby, a poacher has to kill 15 other gibbons. This is because they're still attached to their mother at that age. The poachers will shoot her first. They will then shoot the father because he will be trying to protect them. In most cases, the baby won't survive the fall from the trees, so the poachers have to kill a few more families until one baby lives. Then, the real pain starts. They have their fangs ripped out without anesthetics so they can't bite. They will be drugged so they will stay awake during the night, when the tourists roam the streets. They will be chained so they can't escape. They'll be kept in tiny cages, fed the wrong food. Some will be taught to drink alcohol or even smoke, and as soon as they are no longer of use, they will be left to die. The poachers will then go and find the next baby. As you can imagine, most of the gibbons in that sanctuary were pretty traumatized. But still, working with them was fascinating. They all had their own personalities, including little quirks and preferences and biases. Most of them were shy. Some only tolerated men near them. Some disliked girls with blonde hair, and that kind of thing. One female took a particular liking to me. Every time I walked by her cage, she would start playing with herself furiously. Her boyfriend, who was kept in the same cage, did not seem to care at all though. I spent my days cutting fruit, mixing cement, hosing shit down the drain, and getting bitten by mosquitoes. Even though it was hard labor without any real pay, it was probably one of the best times of my whole trip. We all felt like we were doing something selfless, something noble. It was a truly fulfilling experience. Then, one day, I was scheduled to work in the quarantine area. This is the place that tourists never get to see. It's where they keep really bad cases. The gibbons there had been damaged beyond all hope. They told me some of the things that had been done to them. Unspeakable horrors. All of them were either too sick, too weak, or too aggressive to ever be released back into the wild again. To be blunt, most of them were batshit crazy. First, there was Nini. She was hyperactive and showed self-mutilating behavior. You always had to feed her first. If she saw you give food to a different cage before hers, she would flip her shit, rip out her water container throw herself down to the floor and start biting at her own arm. She was also kind of me. The other volunteers had warned me that she would try to startle me. She would hide in a dark corner of her cage, or act as if she was busy or sleeping. But as soon as you turned your back to her, she would jump at the bars right behind you with this ear-piercing scream and rattle the fence. I have dropped more than one food basket in this manner. After a few times of that happening, I got sick of her shit. I filled my mouth with water and walked closely by her cage, facing away, just far enough that she could not reach me if she stuck her hand through the wire. As soon as I heard her move, I instantly turned around and spit the water at her. It did not hit her. Gibbons have lightning fast reflexes, but she never tried to scare me again after that. There was one who literally looked and behaved like a zombie. His name was Fanta. He'd been blinded by an infection in both eyes. They were white and foggy. Big chunks of his fur had fallen out, giving him a very decrepit appearance. 
He never swung and only moved by slowly walking along the branches in his cage. He had to rattle his food basket during feeding time so he would know when to come and eat. Another one was called Pam. She was special. They never told me what had happened to her, but she was missing one foot, one hand, and all but two fingers on her other hand. You had to cut up her food into really small pieces because she had a hard time eating. She was already old for a gibbon and very calm, yet there was something out of the ordinary in her eyes, something intelligent. She was the only gibbon we were allowed to touch. We had to because we needed to apply cream and powder to her stump. She hated the powder though and would only allow it if she got a little massage first. Like all gibbons in this area, she was alone in her cage. I guess she just missed being groomed by a partner. The Thai worker told me the story about how, some years ago, a volunteer who was going to clean her water container found it empty. That was unusual for Pam, because she only had two fingers. She wasn't really able to drink that fast. He turned the container upside down just to be sure, when a dark green scorpion fell out and crawled away. There were a few more apes in the quarantine area, whose names I've already forgotten, but there is one name I will never forget. Boro. Boro was huge for a gibbon and strong. If he managed to get a hold of your shirt, he could pull you into the cage and rip it right off of your body with one pull. Same thing was true for tufts of hair. While most gibbons get really excited during feeding time, Boro was different. The first time I approached his cage, he didn't even come down to see what kind of food he would be getting. I could already hear him chew on something up in his cage. Black feathers were floating down from his branch. He had somehow managed to catch a bird. And Boro was one of the few gibbons who still had his fangs. There was also something wrong with his lungs. He was the only one he could actually hear breathing. And when he sang, which he did not do too often. It had this weird, rattling tone to it. And he was also infected with hepatitis. I can't remember which. And since he liked to throw his shit around, his hands were sometimes covered in it. So you better make sure not to let him scratch you. They had tried to find a girlfriend for him a few times, but it never worked out. It seems like he just hated other gibbons. And for some reason, he really really hated me. They told me that Boro was not fond of new volunteers, but with me, it was a different level. For example, we used the water hose to clean the cages. The water pressure had to be quite high, because after some time in the sun, everything would just dry and really stick to the bars of the cage. Gibbons don't like to get wet. That's why most of them hid in the top corners when we were cleaning the cages. During those few minutes, I felt like I was in charge. I did not have to constantly cover my back. One mistake did not mean a new scratch or a urine stain. But to Boro, the hose meant nothing. Whenever I came close to his cage, he instantly tried to rip it from my hand. He didn't even care if he got soaked. He just cared about catching me or taking something away from me. Whenever I worked in quarantine, I could feel his stare. Whatever I did, he was watching me. Every single time I came close, he tried to grab me. He would hide in the shadows of his little house or behind some branches, then jump at the fence and reach through it. His claws were always exactly at face level, sometimes just a few inches away, grasping desperately. The keepers told me they'd never seen behavior like that. One day, a huge spiderweb had appeared overnight between a tree and the cage next to his, blocking my usual path. I am not a fan of spiders and I was behind on schedule, so instead of removing it, I tried going around it. It meant I had to get a bit closer to Boro's cage than usual. I thought it was still far enough. It wasn't. I tried to squeeze past the tree with my back to his cage. He caught the collar of my shirt. I was lucky that I was already holding onto the tree, otherwise he could have pulled me to the cage. I heard him hiss behind me as I managed to pull away, my shirt tearing, and me falling face first into the web. 
I took a little walk afterwards to calm myself down. When I returned, he was quietly sitting in the shadow of his house again, breathing this slow, rattling breath. That was the last time I ever saw him. Things I'm about to tell you next, I did not see with my own eyes, but the keepers told us at lunch a few days later. That morning, when the keepers and some volunteers arrived at the quarantine, they felt like there was something wrong. Gibbons usually sing, especially in the early hours of the day. You can even hear them from miles away if they give it their all. But this morning, it was quiet. The first thing they noticed when they entered the area was a huge red puddle under Fanta's cage. What was left of him was hanging in the feeding area. They found parts of him in his food basket, outside his cage and on the ground. The second thing they noticed was that Boro's cage was empty. What had happened was that the part where his little house was screwed to the back of the cage had rusted and combining its weight with his strength. He managed to rip it out and squeeze himself through the hole it left. Then he must have lured Fanta to the edge of the cage by rattling his food basket. None of the other Gibbons were hurt, fortunately. It was partly my fault that he escaped. The volunteers were supposed to check the integrity of the cages at least once a week. The tool we used for that was a long stick with a metal hook on the top. It should have been used to pull at the rusty parts of the grid to see if they still hold, but that type of work is a pain in the ass. The tool was heavy, the gibbons would always go crazy and grab it. You had to go to places in the area that were hard to reach and that kind of thing, so almost nobody cared to do it properly. The team they had to catch the gibbons was literally one guy with a blow to. He was actually a great guy. He taught us how to cook a rice and bamboo, and he could climb a tree in seconds, but he was an alcoholic. Almost every night, he would down a bottle of Sang Song and then try to find his way into the women's bungalow. Nobody really had any hopes of catching Boro again, unless he would return to his cage by himself, which some Gibbons before him actually did. From the moment they told me that Boro had escaped, working in the sanctuary became quite stressful for me. I always imagined him watching me from the trees outside. They went looking for him in the forest, but there was no trace, not even once we heard him sing in the distance. Still, every time a branch snapped somewhere behind the trees, I twitched. During the next week, we heard that some tourists had been attacked by a wild gibbon. They went out in the forest and looked for the culprit, but nothing came out of it. The following night I was awakened by a familiar sound. At first, I thought it was my roommate snoring. Then I realized it came from the window, which had no glass. There was only a mosquito net. A slow, rattling breath. It was Boro. It was pitch black, but I'm sure it was him. He was holding his breath every couple of seconds, as if he wanted it to be quiet so he could listen for something. I just lay there, trying to not make any sounds. I thought about what I was going to do if he decided to come inside. My plan was to use my blanket to shield my body, and my roommate would surely help. After a few more moments, the rattling breathing stopped one more time. It never resumed. He was gone. The next day, I told our boss that I was leaving. It was not only because of Boro, some of the other people that I really liked were leaving too. I just felt like my time there was over. There were many more places in the world I wanted to see. I'm sure they were able to afford a few new cages with the money I left them, so I didn't feel bad about my decision. I don't know if Boro ever returned to the sanctuary. When I think about it now, I just feel sorry for him. He was not evil, just a wild animal that had experienced more terrors than the most of us can imagine. This takes place when I was studying abroad in Milan. I'm a woman, and I was 21 at the time. 
I was at the Pam Supermercado buying my groceries for the week. I am on the far right of a food aisle, and I see a guy do a double take to look at me from the other end. He mutters something, and another guy walks beside him and starts staring at me as well. I'd grown used to men staring at me, so I didn't think much of this. I just kept walking to the next aisle. I started inspecting some canned tuna, but could feel them watching me again. I acted like I was turning around to inspect cans of tomatoes behind me, but I checked to see if they were there. Not only were the two guys watching me, but now two more men had joined them. I walked away again, this time shooting them a pissed off look. I heard them talking, but it was too quiet to understand. Even if it was louder, my Italian is not the best, and I probably wouldn't have understood them. The four guys walked out of the store, each taking a moment to find and look at me before they did. Then, they're gone. I'm relieved. About two minutes later, I'm going to check out, and a man walks up to me and asks, Do you speak English? I said yes and asked if he needed any help. He said no and tells me he's the store manager. His English is not perfect, but he says, I wish to warn you that outside the store are six, no, seven men. Ah oh, yes, there are seven men outside waiting for you. You should not go out there for some time. Waiting for me? I asked. How do you know they're waiting for me? He laughs nervously embarrassed. Well, they're saying things about you. They, uh, they're saying things they will do to you. And it, uh, yes, the things they said. They talked of you. They described you. It is you. They're waiting for you. Do not go out. What things did they say? No, you do not want to know. But do not go outside. They say they wait for you. I looked out the front entrance and can see them across the street, looking at the front entrance, waiting. There are seven of them, as the man said. Some are pacing. I feel like I'm being hunted. I am freaked the fuck out. I start looking through my phone contacts to see who could help me. Before I figure that out, the man comes back a minute or two later and says he found some police officers and told them the situation. When they started walking towards the seven men, they all ended up running away. I'm so lucky this man warned me and helped me. I have no idea what would have happened otherwise. It's one of those things I think about less and less often, but when I do remember it, it scares me. I'd been living in Prague for about a year. I taught third grade at a bilingual school during the day and worked door security for a tourist bar at night. Weekends I would get off work around 3 or 4, depending on how busy it was, at which point I would take the tram from the city center to JZP, where my apartment was located. At the time I was 22 years old and had short black hair and round glasses. Just remember this. One night I stood at the back of the tram Headphones in, despite my phone being dead. They were like a security blanket to prevent me from socializing with drunk English speakers that populated the city center that time of night. This group of seven guys, looking to be between 25 and 30, got on being loud and drunk. I'm okay with accents, and these guys were definitely British, probably there for a stag do. I ignore them until I hear this conversation. I'd fuck that Harry Potter looking girl, one of them said. Like she'd fuck you, mate, another chimed in. Like I'd give her a choice, he replied. There was laughter and high-fiving. How can you even tell that's a girl? Only one way to find out, isn't there, he said, followed with more laughter. I keep staring at my Kindle, acting like I couldn't hear them and didn't speak English, but internally I was screaming in panic. My stop was only two away and I figured I'd want to be as close to my flat as possible when I got off. So I sit there, ignoring the leering until the tram gets to my stop. I get off. I've got three blocks up and half a block over to get to my flat. They then get off. 
I rationalized to myself. I had a test. A stupid thing I did to see if people walking behind me were following me. I crossed at weird places in the street. They crossed. I pick up my pace and now I'm walking fast but not running. Their pace picks up and laughter emanates from the group behind me. I refuse to look back. I make the three blocks with them steadily closing the gap to me. I turn left and bolt, running as fast as I can go, keychain with rock in my palm and building key between my thumb and pointer knuckle. I slam the door, and even though it locks automatically and doesn't have a turntable handle, I throw the deadbolt and continue running to my flat, where I also turn the deadbolt. I get to my room, which faces the street, and I call up in the corner, shaking. As through my open window, I can hear, Where'd that bitch go? Along with other things I'm not going to say. After about 15 minutes, I hear them go away. My parents divorced when I was around eight. My mom moved to another province while I stayed with my dad. I would fly for visits as an unaccompanied minor up until the age of 12. The unaccompanied minor program essentially buddies you up with the flight attendant, and you stay with them for the entire trip. When I turned 12, I was on my first solo flight that had a layover. I was always told as a kid about people you can trust in uniforms and that kind of thing being an indication of a trustworthy adult. When a man, in what I assumed to be pilot overalls, approached me and struck up conversation, I thought nothing of it. I let him know I had a layover and was waiting for my next flight. He told me he was a helicopter pilot and was between flights as well. He said it was nice talking to me and offered to take me to a coffee place for some donuts while we waited. Stupidly, I accepted the offer and began to follow him. As we approached the main doors, my, oh shit, radar went off. I abruptly stopped and told him I wouldn't come. He was very persistent about me coming and pointed to a truck in the parking lot saying it was his, which freaked me out even more. He continued on his way, and I think about that interaction a lot. I'm haunted by what if. Maybe it was completely innocent. I moved to a new city last year for work. I had a lot of trouble finding a decently affordable place to live, so at the time, I found a small apartment on the edge of a bad part of town, but it was affordable and newly renovated. Initially when I moved in, I had no issues but soon discovered that the couple upstairs were a little rough around the edges, always screaming at each other, throwing things, slamming doors 24-7. It made for a lot of sleepless nights. One thing I found out was the guy upstairs was a drug dealer. One night I had gotten home from work pretty late, so by the time I finally cleaned up dinner and started getting ready to sleep, it was about 10.30pm. I just lay down in bed when I heard a knock at the door, and honestly, I shouldn't have even considered opening it. Because, well, three things. It was 10.30 at night. I wasn't expecting anyone. And to get to the main building and up to the apartment doors, you have to have a key or have an apartment buzz you in. Still, I made my way to the front door of the apartment, cracked it open, and found a man probably in his late 20s to early 30s wearing a black hoodie and jeans, rocking back and forth in my driveway. As soon as he saw the door open, he leaned right in to try to push his way into my apartment, repeating the same sentence over and over. I need to talk to Brad, let me in. I need to talk to Brad, let me in. Obviously, I don't want this guy in my apartment, so I'm trying to shove the door closed while telling the man that no Brad lives here. It's just me. This went on for what felt like forever, but in reality it was probably only two or three minutes. Suddenly he stood straight up and just walked away. Nothing said. I was a bit shaken, so I went into my room and just sat there for a while, 
wondering why the hell I would open the door in the first place to a random stranger. I ended up hearing a commotion from the lobby area. I went down and saw how this guy got into the building. The glass front door was completely smashed in, which explains how he got into the building. Going back to the neighbor upstairs, he was a drug dealer, and this was someone who regularly bought off of him. He came into the building trying to find him, for reasons I can only imagine were pretty sinister. He was trying to force his way into my apartment after all. So for starters, I work overnights at a hotel in a seedy area. I'm female and work the night on it. My personality is that of an unapproachable shrew with the looks of a sultry, overworked hotel employee. As of writing this story, I'm currently awaiting for the police to show up so I can make my statement. It was so sudden and abrupt, I'm still shaking. An inebriated man was standing outside with his attractive girlfriend, having a cigarette. He was loud and overall being disgustingly affectionate. I remember asking myself, why are you outside doing this when you just paid money for a place to do this exact thing in? While they are doing this, unknowingly to them, I noticed a man wearing an army uniform walking towards them at a very steady pace. The army man stops right next to the inebriated guy puts his hand on his shoulders, which startles him, and says something. I'm assuming he was asking for a cigarette. Regardless, the inebriated man stops what he's doing and starts to fumble around in his pocket. I guess the man had a cigarette because he went to extend his hand out to the soldier. And all of a sudden, a red Ford or something speeds around the corner like a bat out of hell. It stops right in front of the couple, and then the woman was pulled into the car. The inebriated man is then also thrown in. The soldier jumps in and they drive off. I observed this all from my front desk. There was nothing I could do, no matter how fast I ran. No matter how quickly I could have gotten to her, it would not have been fast enough with the situation that had just taken place. Let this please be a lesson to everyone out there. No matter how safe you may feel, you are not. This is another story that happened in college, during my final year in college. I was living in a two-bedroom on-campus apartment with four other girls. My actual roommate, Christine, is a sweetheart and we're still like sisters even now, after over ten years of friendship. That was our third year rooming together and we even signed up for the same summer abroad programs. We like to joke we've used up all of our roommate luck by finding each other, because all of our suite and apartment mates were interesting. The other two girls sharing our apartment were Chelsea and Brittany. Chelsea was normal, but Brittany was problematic. She would always bring different guys home every night, which was fine, except for the fact that she was in a relationship with a cop who carried a gun everywhere with him and had serious anger and jealousy issues. Oh and she'd have sex all over every surface of the apartment. The night this incident happened, there was a St. Patrick's Day party with free concerts happening in the school, so there were lots of people on campus. Brittany and Chelsea had gone off to party, but Christine and I decided to stay at home to binge on friends' reruns, because we're so lame. In the middle of our friend's binge session, we heard someone hammering at our door. Hey, can you let me in? I need to borrow your phone. It was a male voice. We immediately assumed it was one of Brittany's guys. Sometimes it would make up stories just to get into our apartment, then refuse to leave until she came back so they could hook up or get into shouting matches. What should we do? Christine whispered to me. I knew what she wanted, but she was too nice to say it, so I said it for her. Let's pretend we're not in and not answer. We were in no mood to entertain a guy for a few hours, 
while he waited for Brittany to get back. The guy banged on our door and asked to borrow our phone several times, but eventually he gave up and left. We had fun watching the rest of the episode when our phones buzzed. We both checked our phones, and it was an automatically generated campus-wide alert text. There was a stabbing on campus. It was in our very apartment. It happened in the unit right above ours. The stabber was an unidentified male, and he was still on the loose. I looked at Christy and asked her, Uh, could it be? She looked unsure, but said, No, it couldn't. Yeah, it couldn't be. We made sure we barricaded the door to our room before we slept, though, in case Brittany brought Mr. Stabby home. I mean, she doesn't have the best taste in men. The next day we read the school paper to find out more about the incident. Apparently, the guy knocked on the victim's door, asking to borrow her phone. She let him in, and as soon as he was inside of her apartment, he grabbed a knife from the kitchen countertop and stabbed her multiple times in the stomach. He was a complete stranger, and it seems that his only motivation is to stab someone. Since the campus was filled with thousands of people during the party, the guy easily slipped into the crowd and disappeared. Our apartment was on the ground floor and right next to the stairs. If someone was to go knocking on every apartment, our apartment was most likely before the victim's apartment. Christine and I spent a few minutes shouting, Holy shit, holy shit, oh my god. Turned out, having a shitty apartment mate may have saved us. If you were a fellow lion during that time, you'd remember that it was a month after there was a shooting over at a high school basketball game, hosted on campus. Fortunately for me, I was graduating in two months, so my mom didn't pull me out of LA and make me move back to Indonesia ASAP. Yes, my mom received the alert too. She knew our apartment's layout so she also pieced everything together and realized it could have been me or Christine. This was in 2018, probably 10 at night. My sister, who was 15 at the time, and myself, 18, played volleyball together for our high school. We would obviously ride home together after our games. Our mom was probably about 10 minutes behind us. I live about 30 minutes outside of town, in a little neighborhood out in the country, so all of my neighbors and I live down gravel roads. The neighborhood has no street lights, so it's pitch black outside, except for my car's headlights. As we're pulling up to turn onto a gravel road, we notice a person wearing a black hoodie, standing by our neighbor's mailbox. Of course, I had just stopped the car, and we both just stared at this strange person. We knew it wasn't one of our neighbors, because we've lived there our entire lives. None of our neighbors would be out just taking a walk in the middle of the night, so it was definitely weird. As we're staring, this person starts walking towards my car, I freak out and do a U-turn in our driveway. I book it down the neighborhood road. I could have just turned into our driveway and went home, but I didn't want this person to follow us, because we're just two teenage girls and would be home alone until our mom got back. I called my grandma, who lives like five miles away, and explained the situation to her, and we went to her house. I called my mom also and told her not to go home, that we're currently at our grandma's house. My mom called our neighbor, and they called the sheriff, but the guy was gone. We went back home and ended up sleeping in the same bed in case the person came back. It was definitely a creepy and unsettling encounter, because who knows what this person wanted, or if they would have followed my car down the driveway and potentially did something to my sister and I. I'm just glad I turned around and left. I never saw that person again. A 
week or so ago, I went for my very first job interview. It was just a 10 minute bus ride away, and I happened to get a seat alone because it was like 10 in the morning, meaning rush hours were well over. So there I was, 18 and all dressed for the occasion, looking kind of like Amy from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. That's how I dressed. I was sitting there, minding my own business, listening to music, when I made eye contact with him. Mid-thirties, dark, tightly curled hair, somewhat of a small beard and creepo-style mustache, sloppy dress and a backpack. I didn't take any notice until I was getting off, and he got off too. He said hello to me. I said hi back, not taking much notice, and thanked the bus driver. Straight away, this guy was on me. He began to ask my name and what my phone number was. I felt uneasy and creeped out. So I told him I wasn't allowed to tell random strangers that, because my parents were protective. That was a total lie. They're actually chill when it comes to these things. He then began this pity spiel about how he came from somewhere in India. He had no friends or family in Ireland, and that he was so lonely. Then he asked for my address, and I noped again. He was saying how he'd meet my parents, and they could get to like him. I instantly lied, and said my interview was soon. When really, it wasn't actually for another 50 minutes or so. But fuck it, I made a good impression by being early. I came out afterwards feeling good, and this guy was waiting outside for me. He began to stroll around with me and followed me into the pharmacy. He then began telling me how he worked as a chef in the resort in the village, and he would bring me for tea. I lied and said I had no money, to which he said he'd pay for me because the bus wouldn't be there for an hour and we could walk down when we saw the bus arrive. I declined and said I wanted to have a walk around by myself because my friends living nearby would be meeting me. The reason I lied, you can't see the bus from the resort. He seemed intimidated by the pack thing and kind of scurried off. A few reasons why I lied. Number one, he seemed way too upfront. Number two, he was smiling and laughing when he told me the pity story, meaning he wasn't really sad about it. Number three, I know a girl who's a pastry chef and the daughter of a baker. I've done home economics classes. Facial hair isn't usually allowed in a hotel or resort kitchen areas. And number four, that scenario is how most law and orders, CSIs, criminal minds, and other shows start. So, cut to a while later, I'm hanging out at the bus stop, and the bus arrives. Guess who doesn't? That man. My mom and her friends spent the day at the beach in Florida. The friend that drove had to go to work, but they stayed and said they would walk home. They were walking back and it was burning hot in the high 90s. A white pickup truck drove past them, then slowed down and made a U-turn. The man in the car stopped to talk to them. I should preface this with the fact that my mom and her friend were both drop-dead gorgeous. They were wearing bikinis and shorts. They said the truck that stopped was driven by a young man that was very handsome and probably in his late 20s. He offered them a ride. My mom said no, but her friend started to whine and said, Come on, it's hot and we have another mile to go, and we'll just take a few minutes. My mom still didn't want to, but her friend climbed in the truck, and my mom didn't want to leave her alone, so she reluctantly climbed in the front seat with her friend in between her and the man. Her friend was a chatty Cathy. She talked away to this guy without paying attention to anything around her. My mom had a bad feeling and noticed the man still hadn't turned his truck around. He was heading out to the dunes where there was nothing but deserted beaches for miles. She looked over and noticed the man was touching himself. My mom instantly became angry and she grabbed the door handle and opened the door. She said, You need to stop this fucking truck right now and let us out. You sick fuck. At the same time her friend snapped out of it and saw what was going on. She flipped her shit, and according to my mom, 
dove straight over her and out of the moving truck. As she jumped out, the man tried to grab her and only got a hold of her bikini top, so it came off. She said she watched as her friend hit the ground and everything was like slow motion. The man then began to speed up. My mom was looking at how fast the ground was moving, and the man says, You can stay in here with me, or you can jump out. You're gonna die either way. That was enough for my mom. She jumped out and skidded across the road. Her entire left side was road rash from head to toe. She lay on the ground, dazed, wondering if she was gonna die. Her now topless friend ran over to her, screaming, Get up. He's coming. He's coming back. My mom rolled over and looked in time to see him doing a U-turn, speeding back to finish what he started. Her friend helped her back up and they ran towards the beach. They just happened to jump out right where the lifeguard station was. They were greeted by lifeguards, many of them their friends who administered first aid. My mom went through months of healing and had sprained an ankle. Her friend was unharmed and the man was never caught. I work night shift in Taunton, Massachusetts, in a particularly sketchy area of town. On break tonight, around 3 a.m., I went to get a coffee at Cumberland Farms, I'd have noticed if anything was on the windshield during the drive, because multiple times I had to use my wipers. I go inside, and there was nobody there, nor was there anyone inside, minus the clerk, who was normal enough, and never went outside during this time. I had parked around the back corner, and I came back outside, so I go to unlock my car. I remember seeing someone standing in the dark by the dumpster. I didn't think much of it. But there was a horrible feeling that I was being watched. As I'm unlocking my tiny coupe, I notice there is a mask tied around my left hand wiper. I tug on it, and it stuck good. I never noticed it at all on the drive, and it was a thick mask. It would have been seen. I know this, especially after I used them later this evening, and it was horribly obvious. As soon as I realized it wasn't budging, I just got in my car and locked it, being as I'm a pretty tiny girl. There were still no cars in the lot, but the person I saw earlier was not in the dark anymore. They were pretty close to my car, with their phone lit up in their hand. I peeled out of there, but I felt pretty creeped out, like it was a distraction to get me focused on something so they could hurt me. The whole time, I had this paranoid sinking feeling, like someone was watching me, and the fact of how close they were to my car really bugged me out. A few years ago, I was solo backpacking in France. I made a day trip out to Versailles from Paris. You have to take two separate trains to both get out there and get back. I got on my first train heading back from Versailles, and my phone was at 3%. I had it on airplane mode and low power, and I had my headphones in without anything playing to deter people from approaching me. John didn't care. He came over and sat beside me, speaking to me in French. I'd been walking around the gardens all day and wasn't really in the mood to entertain anyone, so I pretended I didn't understand French. He pulled out his phone and went on to Google Translate, asking if I wanted to learn French. I responded with, No, thank you. I went to put my headphones back on and appear even more uninterested, since my body language wasn't enough for him. He continued to ask me questions through his phone, the next one being, where are you sleeping? I lied and said I was in a large hotel with my family, and I was heading back to them. He asked where it was, and all I replied with was, Paris. He then asked me if I was getting off at a specific stop of the subway, to which I said yes to, which was another lie. 
He said that he would go with me. I immediately said no and ended the conversation. I got my headphones on and completely shut him off from talking to me, which prompted him to leave me alone for a couple of minutes. He then got a phone call and said to his friend, Yeah, I'll get off at that stop and I'll meet you at the other. They set off the danger alarm in my head. The stop he was meeting his friend at was the stop I was getting off at. We got to the transfer station and he got up and off the train and he waited for me at the doors. I took my sweet ass time getting up, making sure I had everything, to the point that it was very obvious I was doing it on purpose. He then left to get on the other train, and I slowly got off and made my way onto the next one. I got on the train at the very front and was watching everyone around me to make sure that nobody was being suspicious or watching me, to the point that they all probably thought I was on something. We got to the stop he said he was getting off at. I'm watching the people get off and coming on, as well as everyone and anyone on the platform, but I see no sign of him or anyone paying much attention to me. We get off at the second stop and I get off with the crowd, turn the corner, and there he is with four friends, scanning everyone coming out. I turned around so fast and went the exact opposite way. I took my hair out of my bun and tried to change my appearance as much as I possibly could. As soon as I got out of the train station, I ran back to my hostel and refused to leave it unless I was with one of my roommates. When I was 13 or 14, I would walk to school with some friends. We would all meet across the street from my house next to the corner store. One morning we went in to get some sweets and stuff because it was going to be a long day. When we went to pay, my friends both went first. Then when I went to pay the man behind the counter, he started telling me how it was so pretty for a 13 year old that I had a lovely smile. He then said my stuff was on him and I didn't need to pay. I didn't think much of it because I was an oblivious child, so I just thanked him and left. This ended up going on for a few months and he'd be overly polite and complimentary. He promised to give me things for free as long as I promised to come in again another day. He started questioning where I went to school and what I did, and more things along those lines. And at that point, I started to realize this was a bit too much. After this, I went in one morning. I was tired and stressed, so I wasn't my normally cheerful self. He didn't like this and started telling me to smile. So I gave a little smile, paid for my items, and left. It was at this point, he was following me out the door, shouting, Smile, you have a pretty smile. Please smile for me. Say thank you. Thank you. Smile. Me and my friends all ran away as fast as we could. He chased us down the street a little way. That was the last time I ever saw him because I'm pretty sure he got fired. I was coming back from school, and I stopped at a Starbucks that was close by. As I was going into Starbucks, there was this old white man who begged me to get him a coffee, a small coffee, and me being nice, I said, sure, what do you want? He just said a small coffee. I just say I can get him what I'm getting. He said, okay. So I go inside, get our drinks and come back. Then he asked me if I lived around here. I said, yes. He asked me if I go to the school here and is my apartment near? I said, yes. He asked me if I lived alone and I said, no. And then if I had any roommates, which I said, yes. I felt totally creeped out. This is the first time I've ever had to deal with this type of experience, and honestly, I'm a little grossed out. I don't think I ever want to go to a Starbucks again. This is the reason why I will continue to carry pepper spray and a taser.
Yesterday, I was awoken at 6.30am with banging on my door. I tried to ignore it, but it wouldn't stop. It went on for five minutes. I reluctantly opened it, and there was a man and a woman. The woman asked me if she could have a plastic bag. I looked puzzled as it was such an odd request. Why would she be banging on my door for it? With everything I've read on Reddit, I got a strange feeling. I said no and closed and locked the door. Later that day, my landlord sent me a video of the same lady trying to break into her house, so obviously I was spooked. It got worse when I was driving back home last night. I saw a person walking about 200 yards away. I knew it was her, but I had to know, so I drove past. I was right. She tried to run in front of my car, acting as if she was in trouble or running from something, asking for help. Police have been contacted and are now patrolling more in my area. I'm just glad I discovered this subreddit years ago, because without it, I might have turned to give them a bag, and God knows what could have happened to me. I was about 16 at the time. My family and I went to go visit some relatives we had in a foreign country. I was born and raised in the USA, but we still go back often to visit relatives. My dad didn't want to keep paying for a hotel, so a few years back, we bought an apartment. This trip was our first time staying at the apartment. The way the apartment is set up is there's a living room where the entryway is. It was the only air-conditioned spot. My dad went back to the US to finish up some business as he was going to meet us there at a later time. So it was my mom, my three brothers, and I. The landlord who gave my mom the key was sort of creepy from her description, but it didn't really alarm anyone that much. Another important thing to the story is, my mom got the key and met the landlord alone since we were taking care of things at my uncle's house. It had been a few weeks and my mom couldn't stand her room since there was no air conditioning. I didn't blame her, so we all slept in the living room. Nothing out of the ordinary happened until about four weeks into staying there. At around 2am, my mom was waking me up, but with a finger over her mouth, basically saying, keep quiet. My mom never does this, so I shut up and made a hand motion, asking what was going on. She pointed to the door, and someone was jiggling the doorknob. We had forgotten to lock the door, but thank god my older brother got into the habit of using chain locks from his college days. It should be noted that my brother was dead asleep in another room, so I was now the oldest male. My mom was distraught and I was thinking about what to do. I was thankful that at least the chain lock was there, but I think the man on the other side noticed that that was all. I see a face pressed up from the small gap. And I shit you not, it was the landlord. He finally gives up after about 10 minutes, or so I thought. The next thing I see is a coat hanger trying to open the chain lock. I finally decide to do something, so I body check the door, slamming it shut. I lock the actual lock, and yelled in the foreign tongue what would be the equivalent to, fuck off. I look through the people, and the man seems surprised to hear a man's voice. I guess he assumed my mom was alone and the only one to check in. He scrambled down the stairs. All said and done, he was gone by 2.30am. I looked out the window across the street at the landlord's house. He just stared at me, and then turned off the lights in his house. When we woke up, I told my brother. We called the police, but they said we didn't really have any evidence. It was our word against his. My mom wasn't sure it was the landlord, but I swore it was him. I had seen him. My dad arrives four days later, and I told him the story. He met with the landlord and agreed he was creepy. My dad actually believed me. My mom didn't feel safe anymore, so we left that apartment the day after my dad arrived. As we drove away, the landlord gave me a little smirk and wave. By now, it was daylight and I kind of wanted to beat the shit out of him. I 
A few years ago, my roommate Chloe and I moved into the perfect apartment in a six-unit building. It was on a street we immediately fell in love with. Chloe and I are both in our early 20s, who moved from a small town to a major city in the last five years, so we felt like real adults living in this place. Within the first couple of weeks, we began to suspect we were in close proximity of an ongoing domestic dispute between the tenants and the unit upstairs. At this time, we hadn't seen or met them, so we really had no idea the context of the relationship. A man's loud, angry ranting, with no shortage of aggressively insulting comments, responded by inaudible mumbles, prompted us to think a woman may be in a potentially violent environment. Chloe and I decided we would try to listen, in case things ever escalated too far, and maybe try to offer the woman help in the meantime. That's if we ever met her. Over the next six weeks, we continued to hear him, but we had not seen anyone, and there were no real developments. When he was really loud, we tried to record him on our phones. One Sunday afternoon, I was home alone, cleaning my kitchen, which was located at the back of our unit. The man upstairs was having a very loud and long rant, and for the first time, I heard a clear response. I could make out a woman's voice telling him to shut up and leave her alone, in an almost annoyed rather than fearful tone. He did not appreciate that and began yelling at her, which eventually led to him banging something against his floor. Eventually he did one so hard that my kitchen lights began to flicker, I could see debris falling from the ceiling. This freaked me out, and I called my boyfriend, Ted. When Ted answered, I whispered into the phone, Don't say anything, just listen. The man upstairs continued to yell, but it wasn't until there was another bang that Ted could hear. I said into the phone, That's my upstairs neighbor. He's been going on like this for a long time. I've been trying to record some of it. Here's where the story really takes a turn. Considering how clearly we could hear him upstairs, it makes sense he could make out what was being said below him. All six units were connected by a stairway outside at the back of the building. I heard very loud steps running down them. Next thing I know, there are three heavy raps on my door and an angry voice saying, So you can record my conversations, but you can't answer the fucking door. I was instantly paralyzed and worried he would come by the window where I was standing. After about 20 seconds, I heard the steps return upstairs, and that familiar voice call up. No one's home. I collected myself from the shock and fear of what just happened. I left my apartment to make some calls. I decided to phone my landlord first, as he seemed like he would know what to do if we were having issues with another tenant, and I was very confused about what was happening. I told him the chronology of events since moving in and he provided me with some very interesting information. The tenants above us was a mother and son, Rita and Ivan. Ivan is 36, and him and his mom have been living in the building for 10 years. During that time, Ivan never had a job, and in the last couple of years had caused some problems for the landlord, specifically him and the previous tenant of our unit, who had moved out over a year ago, had butted heads several times, which is why my landlord had decided not to mention anything to us. He knew Ivan had some issues, but assumed it was an isolated and contained issue. The last thing the landlord had told me was that while the previous tenant was in our unit, Ivan had approached them, accusing her of installing something in his wall to listen to him. Maybe I'm dense, but this did not set off immediate alarms something more serious was going on with Ivan. I was still believing the woman's voice I heard belonged to someone in danger, so I called the city non-emergency police line, who sent a car over to make sure she was safe. She was, and they promptly left. After our call, the landlord began to build a case to evict my upstairs neighbors, on the grounds they were impeding on other tenants' ability to enjoy their space. Things upstairs had been mostly quiet for two days, until I was in touch with the landlord again over the phone. He provided me with some more information, Specifically that he believed when Ivan was ranting, it was towards the previous occupant of our unit, rather than Rita. This obviously seemed odd to me, but we were still trying to piece everything together, so we had to keep an open mind. 
the landlord also reiterated how Ivan really changed in the past couple of years and had caused problems before. His reasoning for not giving us a heads up before moving in was that since the last tenant had moved out, he had been quiet and kept to himself. In the days after this call, the ranting started up again as we waited for an update on the eviction process. That Friday, we received confirmation that Rita and Ivan had been served with their first warning of eviction, so we expected to hear some action. Sure enough, that night while I was in bed, I heard Ivan's voice from above. Shh, I'm trying to listen. At this point, I'm definitely concerned, but I really had no idea where this was going and how quickly. The next evening, Chloe called me while I was at work. She told me she thought she heard a knock at our back door. I told her I wouldn't be home for a couple of hours, but if she was concerned, I could leave early, or she could call the non-emergency line. Chloe told me she was going to see if anything happens, and that she would be okay. At around 10pm, I came home, and by midnight, I was on the phone with the non-emergency myself, because Ivan had come downstairs to my back window, where I was standing, asking us to leave him alone because we were harassing him. Chloe and I had been in our kitchen talking about our days, having agreed we would try to live our lives despite the situation. At one point, the subject of upstairs briefly came up, and the next thing I knew, the man I had only ever physically seen once, with long, dark, greasy hair, and a look of emptiness in his eyes, was standing at my back window, next to where I was sitting. My immediate response was to pull out my phone and start recording him. Yeah, you can record me, he said. Can you leave me alone? You and your friends harass my home every day. This got my adrenaline going, and suddenly I heard myself call back. Bye, Ivan. I called the police and we waited for them to arrive. When he went back upstairs, he started ranting to Rita and said some very weird and unsettling things. He said we were sexually harassing him, and that us, the landlord, and the previous tenant were all associated. He then mentioned the bat we have beside our back door, which he wouldn't have seen at the window. Therefore, he had listened to us mention it. He also knew my name, having only ever seen me once. The police arrived and essentially told us there was nothing they could do. They knocked at Ivan and Rita's door. However, no one answered, and they stayed silent. The officer advised us to go to the station the following day and have a specific officer assigned to check in on us and monitor everything. They left and I called my boyfriend to come and stay over for the night. In the hour after the police left, Ivan ranted sporadically, repeating much of the same things we'd been hearing in the past week. Ted came over, he heard for himself what was going on and agreed it was very unsettling. Banging came from upstairs, and Ted said he was going to go out back for a smoke. That if Ivan came outside to call 911. Ted had injured his back the previous week, and was concerned if Ivan was going to try to come downstairs again. He decided to bring the bat with him. Minutes later, Ivan had come outside and was standing at the top of the stairs, yelling that he was going to knock us out. He started coming down the stairs when Ted picked up the bat telling Ivan to stay upstairs. I called 911, and our downstairs neighbor came outside to help us, having heard the commotion. The police arrived, and I experienced some of the saddest minutes of my life. For starters, when the police went upstairs this time, Rita answered and completely defended her son. The woman we had initially been concerned was at the receiving end of domestic abuse, told the officers we were not leaving her son alone that he'd almost been attacked by my boyfriend. The police said there was nothing they could do and left us for what felt like bait in order for our concerns to be taken seriously. They left. We heard Ivan amp up again. This time he was saying he was going to kill those fucking bitches downstairs. So we packed up and left for the night, each staying with a friend. That was a tough night as we both came to realize this apartment we thought was so perfect had a pretty fatal flaw. We had no idea how this was going to end. We met up the following day, and after encouragement from our families, we went to the police station, needing real help 
with a potentially dangerous situation. It was eventually arranged that charges were to be placed on Ivan for uttering death threats. Chloe and I each gave a testimony, and the officers told us it would be going to the apartment to arrest Ivan. They advised us not to stay there for the night, if possible, in the event he refused to be taken by them, as this could escalate things. Without a warrant, the police had no way of forcing Ivan to go with them, but I had a feeling he would be, since I heard him at one point mention that he was the one protecting their home. Sure enough, when the police came to the building, we packed overnight bags. Ivan let them take him away, despite his mother's protests, which included accusing us of lying and threatening them. We packed up our things, watched him get taken away, and we left never spending another night at that apartment. Since all of this, there have been a few updates. First of all, we moved, and the landlord was very generous in his reimbursement to us, having known Ivan had issues that he greatly underestimated. Aside from not wanting to be sued, I really believe the landlord to be a decent guy who just made a judgment call that went completely wrong. We received a few updates on the legal proceedings, both from the charges that were pressed and the landlord's eviction process of Rita and Ivan. Ivan was released the following day on bail with a number of conditions, and we're waiting for a court date, I guess. The landlord is also waiting for a court date, having filled all the pre-required documents. The final piece to this completely bizarre sequence of events was the Facebook profile we found, having looked him up on a whim. Ivan hadn't posted in three years, which lined up with the timeline of when the landlord said he began causing problems. He had some unsettling posts that we provided to the police, in addition to frequent mention of a relationship he was in. He has dozens of posts about the person, with no response, including no likes on any of it. It's strictly posts made to an anonymous person who had no interactions, nor did anyone else. Having researched what I believe Ivan is suffering from, I am curious if this relationship ever existed, or if it was another delusion. That's the story. Thank you for listening to it. The year I turned 10 years old, my mom and I moved into a spacious two-bedroom apartment in what is statistically considered one of the safest cities in America. We moved out just a few years ago after my grandmother passed away, but I spent 12 years living in this place. The apartment was one of five in our building. You know how a duplex has two units in the same building, split down the middle. This building was quartered into four units with an added unit on the lower level. We had the unit above the lower level. Our landlord at the time was kind of a dipshit. If something broke and needed fixing or replacing, he would come and attempt to fix it himself instead of just hiring an expert. And all the while, he'd make comments about how women break things. What can I say? Anyway, at the time of the story, I was 13 years old. Our dumb landlord rents out the lower level unit to a lovely young couple. Their names were George and Lisa. On the night they moved in, I remember they had music just blasting from their new home as they moved furniture and boxes down the stairs with their friends. It was uncharacteristically loud for the neighborhood, but none of us other residents actually had a problem with it. They seemed pleasant enough. The pleasantries lasted about a week before George and Lisa started having these blowout screaming matches. My mom and I would hear her start screaming and cussing him out. He tried to get her to back off and calm down, and then they moved on to the next stage, which was slamming and throwing random shit at each other. Always after an hour or so of this, things would go quiet. Then Lisa would be heard in the back of the house, where the bedrooms were, just sobbing. There was one day where I heard Lisa walking around outside, having a conversation with herself in different voices. A few more weeks and we began to notice that George and Lisa got a lot of strange visitors at strange times, who always seemed intoxicated, and sometimes banged on our huge living room window, without knowing whose window it was. When it was very quiet, 
I heard scraping sounds coming from the kitchen area. A lot. One time I heard George and Lisa having the most obnoxious sex I've ever heard. The night things went too far for us was when a woman showed up at 3 in the morning with an empty milk jug and started ringing every doorbell to our building, scratching at the front door, trying to get in, moaning and yelling for George and Lisa. She disappeared after a few minutes, and suddenly we hear the back door to the building, jiggling. You could tell there was more than one person trying to break in. My mom called the police and we gathered our things and went to a restaurant for breakfast, exhausted after no sleep. We then went and booked a hotel for the night. We just couldn't deal with them again. After we complained to the landlord and the police multiple times, things got quiet and really awkward between us and the neighbors. And that's when the FBI showed up. I shit you not. I go to answer the door, and a man and woman ask if they can talk to my adult. I say sure, and lead them to my unit, which we always kept open during the day anyway. And right there, they open a binder and show us photos of George and Lisa. They ask if we happen to have seen them before, and we tell them they live downstairs. It turns out they're both living under false identities, major fraudsters, and dealing cocaine. Shortly after this, George and Lisa moved into the apartment building across the street, and they were arrested within a month. This happened a few years back. I was 23 years old, married, and had a stepdaughter. I'm a female, divorced from my ex now and I don't see my stepdaughter anymore. But at this time, I was living with them, my cousin, her husband, and their son. We had a townhouse on a dead end that led to some train tracks in my hometown. The neighborhood was decent, but had a lot of houses close together and was highly populated with children. There were usually toys, bikes, and skateboards hanging around on the sidewalks and on the front lawns of houses. This included our house, we resided in the second and third floor of the house, while our landlord's daughter occupied the first floor. Shortly after moving in, two tenants moved into the basement apartment, a middle-aged couple. They seemed alright, but were eerily quiet, at first. They started showing some signs of drug use, and just started showing some odd behavior. For example, they would scream at the top of their lungs at each other over petty things, like wanting a ride somewhere and the other not wanting to give that ride. We were starting to scare our kids. I had a bad feeling about the guy, John. In our state, we have access to criminal records. We can search anybody's state police record. I exercised that right and found out that this guy had pending sexual assault charges against him. Now I was terrified, scared of the kids playing outside. Scared of the kids being in the same building as this guy. Weird things started happening. Like we would wake up in the morning and the kids' toys would be broken. Not just broken, but destroyed. Skateboards would be completely broken in half. My wagon was completely mangled. And toys were thrown down an embankment we had behind our house. We all had a feeling it was him, but we couldn't prove it. One day shit hit the fan. Tension had already started to build. It was clear we didn't like seeing each other, but everyone was so passive-aggressive about everything, until this day. I was dropping my ex off at work while my cousin kept an eye on the kids. They played at the neighbor's house in their fenced-in yard. My phone rang when I was a few blocks away from home. It was my cousin. I remember her saying, I think we're going to have a problem. I asked her why, and she said, John is throwing shit down the embankment and knocking over the garbage bins. My first thought was, those things are full, he must be making a mess. And boy, was I right. I pulled into my driveway to see all of our recyclables scattered across the edge of my driveway. It made my blood boil. I got out of the car and looked over at his door on the side of the house. I saw him throw something out of the doorway and we met I. As soon as that happened, I took that chance to confront him. I yelled over to him. 
What's the fucking problem? Why are you throwing shit all over the place? He didn't take a minute. He started charging at me, saying, What the fuck are you going to do about it? When he made it up to me and was just about to put his hands on me, I punched. I punched this six foot five man in the face. It didn't exactly drop him, but it did knock him down. He fell back and kind of bumped into his van. He fell on his ass in front of it. To put things into perspective, I'm five foot eight, and at the time, I had some extra weight on me, so I wasn't a tiny helpless girl. After this, he got up. With a vengeance, he threw punch after punch after punch. So did I. I was starting to get weak. My arms felt like spaghetti, and I couldn't see a thing. I could hear my stepdaughter screaming, and my cousin yelling for help from the upstairs window. I wiped my eyes, and to my surprise, I saw my other neighbor restraining John. He was still trying to attack me, even after being restrained. He was bleeding badly. I didn't realize it right away, but my nose was broken. My four foot nine cousin was standing in my front yard with a metal chair over her head. My stepdaughter was taken inside with my other neighbor's kids. John was screaming at me, telling me my bird shits in his house. I was just screaming back at him, calling him crazy, a diddler, and telling him nobody wants him here. It felt like a segment of Jerry Springer in between a KY Jelly wrestling match. I ran upstairs to look for my cousin's husband. The scared little man that he was, he was in the window calling the police. When I realized he was useless, I headed back out. John was gone. He took off. The rescue and police arrived where I was questioned. Then I was taken to the hospital. I was released soon after and was about to head out to pick up my ex, whom hadn't even known what happened yet. But I couldn't find my keys, my car and house keys. We checked everywhere and couldn't find them. I started feeling like John stole them before he took off. But they were with my phone. Why wouldn't he have taken my phone? I called the police station and they informed me he was picked up. I took a shot in the dark and asked if they found my keys on it. I described my keys. Green New York Yankees bat keychain. They confirmed yes, he did have them. They asked me if I would like to press further charges. I, of course, said yes. There was a no contact order active, but technically they could not make him leave the house. That was up to my landlord. My landlord kicked them the fuck out. Not before they could squeeze some stalking and harassing it. My good neighbors turned their security cameras on, facing our house. One morning his girlfriend was standing in front of the house, yelling at us, saying all kinds of nasty shit. When we watched it on the footage, what we couldn't see was that he was standing right at our door. She was the bait. He was the hook. Thank God we didn't bite. We caught him doing other creepy shit. Like crawling around my car, not even doing anything, just crawling around the car like he was a cat or something. Weird shit. They moved out, and it was peaceful for the rest of the time they were there. I still see them here and there, usually walking and usually looking angry. Good. A couple of weeks ago, my mom was coming back from the store at around 10pm. She got herself a pack of cigarettes and was hanging out with a friend of hers as she did so. On their way back, they came across Jeremy. It was a guy they'd both met, and even I had seen him a couple of times. Nothing major, just an acquaintance we barely spoke to. Though he was either high as hell this time around, or drunk, or both. I don't know. I do know this wasn't how he usually acts. Jeremy was angry over something. He came up to them and started screaming about wanting to fuck them. He then pulled it out. In public. After both my mom and her friend tried to just walk out of the situation, he started attacking my mom. Both my mom and her friend started fighting back. They managed to get him to stop. They made their way back to the house where I currently am unaware of what the hell was going on. However, note that I said stop, not leave. He lived in the same building as I do and was following them from a distance away. 
So they both made their way upstairs. When my mom realized, she left her keys inside. Nothing new. She's pretty forgetful, and I'm generally here to open the door when she does. The problem being, Jeremy made his way upstairs too, past where his floor is and to ours. He tried to fight her again. I opened the door to my mom shouting my name and being absolutely clueless as she entered and tried to close the door, but Jeremy pushed the door open before it could be shut. He made his way into our apartment. This is where I got involved. I grabbed a knife and threatened him to get out, which he did. I have no idea how he managed to get this impression, but he seemed to think I was trying to find him, because after we made sure to slam the door the exact moment he exited and locked it, he started screaming at the top of his lungs about how we were pussies and to call the police, claiming he knows the landlord and can get him to delete any footage caught from outside of the building and the hallways inside. My mom, being a quick thinker, started recording him from the door as he banged and kicked it, trying to open it. Eventually, he left when he heard we were actually calling the cops. He would think this would be over, right? No. It keeps going. After a couple of minutes, he returns to the door with a knife. He started stabbing our door while screaming and insulting us at the top of his lungs, saying he will kill the cops too. The police can clearly hear him from the phone, and I think that's why they came this time round. The doors in this building are strong stuff, metal I think, I'm not quite sure. But while he made some light holes and scratches, he couldn't do much to it. So he shouts he'll be downstairs waiting for the cops, which we of course inform the cops currently on the phone of. And perfect timing, while he makes his exit, they make their entrance both using two different elevators. Four officers knock on our door and we open up and told them what was going on. We told them what happened start to finish. While my mom showed the cops the footage she recorded, I was taking pictures of the damages to the door. The cops, clearly not wanting to be here, begrudgingly said to come downstairs with them. So my mom and I did, to which we heard screaming from the first floor. Bear in mind, we were on the fifth floor and heard him perfectly, though his screaming stopped really quick when four cops showed up, instantly went, oh shit, and he started playing nice with the cops. The cops were not having any of it, they arrested Jeremy right then and there. His friends were there, asking what he did, screaming and shouting at the cops, but they eventually ran off. Jeremy was taken away. I sent the damages of the door to the lawyers, and I don't know what happened about that. So this is where the story ends, right? No. Jeremy got off with a restraining order, though since he lived in the same building as us, we couldn't stop him from simply being in the building. He was only not allowed to talk to us or cause any problems. This did not last long. On my way to the store, maybe two weeks later, he and his friends were all outside of the building in a group, chatting and drinking. When I walked out, Jeremy instantly switched up the topic, saying, You see that kid? I'm gonna fuck him up. He got the cops on me. Fuck the restraining order. I wanted to get away from that as soon as possible, but I had already left the building and would need to get close to the group I had just finished taking my first couple of steps away from in order to get back inside. So, I quickly make my way to the store, since I would be in public with people present. I end up just getting everything I need from the store while trying to call my mom to tell her what happened. She didn't answer. Great. And here's where I admit I was a bit dumb. I should have instantly called the cops, but I didn't. I didn't remember what Jeremy was wearing, and I am honestly a wreck with anxiety. I wanted to first see if the group was still there before I attempted to make the phone call. They weren't, and I quickly made my way upstairs and informed my mom, who calmed me down and got me to call the police. The exact same police as last time showed up, and thank God for that, since they were well aware of Jeremy being a nutcase from the last time. But this time, we had no proof other than what would just end up being a he said she said scenario. So they had us sit in the hallway while they called their boss to make sure the arrest would be okay 
due to the previous history and restraining order. All the while, Jeremy was in the staircase, laughing and being extremely loud with his friends. Eventually the police got an okay from their boss, and we all made our way to the staircase. I tried to stay out of sight as much as possible, and once again they arrested him. Jeremy claimed to be unaware of what he was being arrested for, and his friends left once again. His sister, who was in her mid-twenties from what I could guess, was screaming though, insulting them and saying he was being arrested for no reason. Jeremy was hauled away again, and I have no idea what happened. There were no calls from attorneys or the police, no nothing, though I ended up seeing him within the week, straying from eye contact with me or my family. He usually walks away the moment he sees us. I wish more came out of this, but I'm happy we are being left alone all the same. Though, he is always pissed at seeing me. I need to explain two things before I tell this story. First... I have a sleep disorder, and I've had it my whole life. I sleepwalk. Nothing too dramatic, mostly just do everyday things while I'm sleeping. Open the fridge, put clothes in the washer without starting it, take the vacuum out of the closet, and set it in the middle of the room and leave. That sort of thing. When I was younger, this was an every night occurrence, but now, in my late thirties, this is now a once or twice a year thing. Second, I am native. I have a healthy respect for the stories of spirits my ancestors told. Many hunting trips, I would sit around the fire with my dad, listening to him tell stories of the tricks Wendigos play to try to lure you out to them. While I'm unsure if I believe the stories of skinwalkers and Wendigo, I don't tend to mess around, just in case. Shoot to roughly three weeks ago, my husband and I both work construction. We have hard, long, and rewarding days. Once dinner is over and planning for the next day is complete, the dogs have been taken out for the last time. Our heads hit the pillows and it's light out, until the alarm sounds. We sleep like the dead. I'm pretty sure a war could break out in our bedroom, thundering tanks and all, and we would sleep right through it, only wandering in the morning where all the holes in the walls came from. Our bedroom is fairly good sized and has a small window in the corner. My husband likes to sleep with fresh air, so he takes the window side of the bed. This particular night though, something woke me up. I never wake up. The dogs were quiet. There was typical northwest weather, rain quietly tapping away, no thunder and no heavy winds. I looked around the dark and quiet room, and nothing was out of place. The only noise, besides the rain, was my husband's box fan gently humming away. I was confused, but decided to adjust my blankets, flip my pillow, and go back to sleep. As I closed my eyes and took a deep breath to relax, I heard my husband. Babe, babe, come out here and give me a hand with the boy. Confused and still foggy from being woken up from a deep sleep a few seconds earlier, I opened my eyes to the pitch black of the room again. Rarely one of our three dogs will need to go out at night, and if he goes out, they will all go. We live in an incredibly rural area, and it's easy for them to get lost in the dark woods. Not a good thing when you have bears, coyotes, cougars, and whatever else on your property. Babe. Babe, can you come out here and help me with the boys? He called again. A voice right against the half-open window. Not concerned, just demanding. Annoyed and groggy, I leaned up, propping myself up on a stiff pile of blankets to look at the window. It was too dark to see him. The floodlight is on the other side of the house. Babe, come outside, my husband demanded. It was the third beckon that bothered me. He was never that pushy. If something was wrong, like one of the dogs wandered off, he would say that. It's happened before. He would say something like, 
Come watch these two real quick. I can't find Murph. Something like that. Something wasn't right. I was regaining my focus and shaking off the sleepiness. Quite awake at this point. I knew it was him. My husband has a very distinct tone. He's a Sicilian from Queens and has a very deep, unintentional loud voice. It was at this moment, staring out the black window, I realized I wasn't leaning on a pile of blankets. The pile of blankets was breathing. I was leaning on my sleeping husband, listening to him call to me from outside the window. Babe, come outside. The voice came again from the window. I put my hand down on my husband's face. He was there, asleep next to me, but his voice, or what I thought was him, was at the window. I lay down next to him, very close to him, and closed my eyes very tight. In moments like these, I'm the type to just try and pretend it's not happening. I didn't hear it again, and spent the next half of the night trying to fight off the spookies. And at some point, I had finally fallen asleep. I told my husband about it the next morning, after his, oh my god, you look like death comment. I hadn't slept well. He laughed it off as I had. Probably had a creepy sleepwalking thing. The thing is, when I have a sleepwalking event, I remember nothing. I don't recall dreaming, walking, or anything from those nights. No matter how hard I try, it's like a blackout. I am sure I was awake for this. Every time I think of it these past few weeks, I remember those hunting trips poking coals around in the fire with a stick, while my dad tells me his serious, yet animated tales of Wendigo tricks to get you to come with them. As silly as it sounds, I think there's a Wendigo in my woods. I live with my boyfriend in a small fourplex in a very small town. I work at 6 a.m., and wake up about 4.30. About two weeks ago, during my morning routine, I noticed someone standing behind a dumpster 20 feet away. I know my apartment is the only one with lights on, and he's looking at my window, just watching for about five minutes when I notice a dog with a man. I just wrote it off, until today that is. This morning I left for work as usual, stepped out the main door and scanned the area. All clear. I walk the ten foot to my car, buckle up and start my music. I back out of my spot and when I shift to drive, suddenly I see a man with a bucket on his head standing at the end of the walkway. They were within three feet of my car. We made eye contact and he pulled the bucket off of his head. The man stepped toward me. I panicked and floored it before he got closer. I'm honestly scared. I even told my boss that if I didn't show up or call, that I was in trouble. I feel so scared. I'm going to be carrying a can of wasp spray to my car every morning at least, until the pepper spray I ordered arrives. The police and the landlord have been contacted, as well as the neighbors. About 10 years ago, I was fresh out of college and trying to figure out what was next. I went to college on an athletic scholarship, and I was just as interested in enjoying my college experience as I was in completing it. I ended up with a communications degree, average grades, and no experience. I was working as a bouncer at a small bar in the casino. I worked at said bar Wednesday to Sunday from around 7pm to 3am. My job was to greet people coming in, check IDs, break up fights, and remove people who got out of hand, while maintaining a professional and friendly manner. There was a man that started coming into the bar on the off nights, Wednesday or Thursday when it was slow. He would come in both nights one week, then not come in again for three weeks or so, and he would do the same thing always on the off nights. Usually he would talk to me a couple of times throughout the night when he was there, just normal small talk. It was never awkward. He was always well dressed in a suit or at least a button-up shirt and slacks. He was clean cut, 
had an athletic build, no visible tattoos or piercings, and a shaved head. I'm not into men, but I would guess he was a good-looking man in his late thirties. Well, the last night I saw him, the conversation was a bit different. He came in on an off night like normal, and eventually came up to talk to me by the door. The conversation started off like normal, but eventually he asked me if I enjoyed what I did at the bar. I did the typical, it's not bad, and it's mostly easy, dissembling that I felt was a polite conversation. He asked me how long I planned to be a bouncer, asked if I thought I made enough money, and eventually dragged out of me that no, I did not particularly enjoy being a bouncer, and I didn't know what I was going to do with my future. At this point, he looked me straight in the face and said, Well, you could kill people. While maintaining our eye contact, I paused and waited for some type of joke or smile or something that would turn this into a failed attempt at a joke. No, nothing. He seemed 100% serious. There was no smile, no joke, nothing but him staring at me, waiting for me to respond. And at this point, I told him the first thing that came to mind. I'm pretty sure I don't have the skill set for what I think you're suggesting. He said, Yeah, but you could learn all that. Think about it. You could travel, work once or twice a month, and get paid really well. While strangely, at that point in my life, it was an intriguing idea, I immediately thought of some sort of police setup and all the shadowy hitman handler betrayal I've seen in every hitman movie ever. I told him, no, I don't think that's for me. He then said okay and left. I worked there for another year and never saw him again. I was in a hotel and happened to be completely alone. Here's some backstory as to why I was alone. Our TV is hooked up to an antenna, so the channels we got were repetitive and boring. It also meant we didn't get Macy's Day Parade. To solve this issue, we went to a hotel relatively close to us. Unfortunately, my mom came down with a horrible illness a day or two before, so she couldn't join us. We also got our room upgrade to the one with a balcony. Remember this, because if the room was not upgraded, I don't think this would ever have happened. This happened the day we were checking out, so it was Thanksgiving Day. Our plan was to hang out the night before, wake up and watch the parade in the morning, then we would get home by the evening. It was around 8ish when the rest of my family, not including my mom, went out to run an errand that popped up. I, being lazy and not wanting to get ready just yet, opted to stay in the hotel room. Before he left, my dad said to double lock the door and always check the peephole should someone strange show up. He even did a practice run before he left. In some weird twist of irony, someone started knocking on the door not even five minutes after they'd left. Doing what my dad instructed, I checked the peephole. I expected to see my dad surprising me with another checkup, but the person who I saw looked nothing like my dad. I believe the man was very old, with grey hair that showed signs of balding. I specifically remember a small cardboard box he held in his hands. I remember thinking that it was some sort of an illegal substance, even at my young age. Fear set in as I stood there, unsure of what to do. Then I remembered what my dad said to me if this situation should ever happen. The man said, Are your parents here? No, they're down in the lobby but will soon be up, I said. Why are they down in the lobby? At this point, I didn't know what to say. I'm sure now my dad meant to talk to them if the hotel staff, so I backed away from the door. In hindsight, I'm also sure he knew what my dad had told me. It would turn out his room was right next to ours. I ended up FaceTiming my mom. I had an iPad because I wasn't allowed a phone at the time. She contacted the rest of my family and said to get hotel staff on the line. I tried calling them, but they didn't pick up. 
Not wanting to annoy them, I did not call again. I know that was stupid of me, but I was young and didn't know how to handle this. While this was happening, the man began banging on my door with a new intensity and was yelling for me to let him in. With all the shouting, I could not hear my mom, so I went out onto the balcony. However, that spot didn't last. I soon went back over to the people to see what was going on. There was what I believed to be a security guard trying to help the man get into my room. The weird thing is, the key he was using didn't work for my door, so there was no way it could have been a master key this staff has. Not to mention, this hotel does not have security, just staff, and I don't remember him wearing a uniform. I walked back out onto the balcony, freaking out. That's when he went into his real room and began banging on the windows, screaming for me to let him in. Terrified, I ran into the bathroom and locked the door. That's where my dad found me. The man's excuse was that his son and his girlfriend were supposed to be staying in our room. That was blatantly untrue, and probably to save himself. I didn't look old enough to be in a relationship, and he should know that since he saw me. If it weren't for my dad telling me to check the door, I would have opened it to that stranger. And with the perfect timing of his arrival, and his knowledge of a young girl being alone, I have reason to believe he was stalking us. Thankfully, I'll never know that outcome. We never did upgrade our antenna, but luckily live streams became a thing. I'm a 21-year-old female. I drive from Miami to Daytona Beach almost every other week. I make sure to fuel up before I start driving. But this one day, this one, this one unfortunate day, I didn't. I left Daytona around 12 a.m. driving back to Miami. I drive a black Mustang 40th anniversary. I was flooring it back home through I-95. The entire route was empty other than a few trucks and small cars here and there. I was jamming to some good music, not paying much attention to what was going on with my fuel tank. Around 2.30 to 2.45 a.m., the low fuel warning came up. I saw it and started looking for the nearest exit, which happened to be Boynton Beach. I have never been there and had no idea about how the area is. I took the exit and saw there's a Circle K right off the exit. I was a little relieved, because now, at least I wouldn't run out of fuel in the middle of nowhere. Now with barely any fuel left in my car, I pull up to this gas station. It's totally empty. I cannot even see a single car inside or even outside on the road. There were no people other than one tall man in a red colored jacket walking around the area near the side of the gas station store where all the parking saw. But he was not very close to the pump I was at. I was a little scared, but I usually try to shake off my fear by telling myself it's nothing. This man at this point is looking at the ground, but kind of walking in the general direction of my car. I'm still inside the car, contemplating whether I should get out or stay in. Usually I would have just gotten out and fueled, not being scared. But that day, something in my gut told me to lock the door and wait inside until he either goes away or walks past my car. At this point, this guy is just a few feet away from my car still not looking at me. I'm trying to tell myself, it's okay, he doesn't even care that I'm here, I should get out. But then, my worst fear comes to life. This man looks straight up at me and dashes towards the driver's side door. He tries opening it. It's around 3 a.m. with no other people in the general vicinity. I froze for a second and thought I was gonna die. He pulled on the door handle several times trying to get it to open, but then I somehow got my senses back. I turned the car on and floored it. He didn't let go of the door handle until I started the car and hit the gas pedal. I'm so thankful that despite the low fuel, my car still started up and drove off. 
I had nothing on me to defend myself. Nothing at all, other than a plastic fork I got from Panda Express earlier that day. I still can't get over the whole experience. It scares the living shit out of me. So this happened to me quite a few years ago, when I was about 17 or 18. I was working at a grocery store as a bagger most days after school. So one day I'm doing my thing, bagging groceries, and this guy, who was probably in his early 20s, comes up and hands me a little slip of paper. He didn't say anything, and he leaves. I was in the middle of working, so I put it in my pocket and forgot about it. A few hours later, I remember it and read it. It's this really creepy poem about how he thinks I'm so beautiful and basically comes into that store just to watch me and is wondering if I've ever noticed him. It has his name and number at the bottom. I didn't realize how creepy it was at the time because I was young and flattered, so later that night, I messaged him. I had a boyfriend, so I thought it would just be nice to tell him that thank you but i'm sorry type of thing i made the mistake of not mentioning my boyfriend outright in the first text i just said thanks for the poem not even five minutes after i read the text this guy adds me on facebook i'm assuming he just searched my phone number and found me and he starts commenting on all my public profile pictures he'd started asking me if i ever wanted to meet up so i text him again and said sorry but i actually have a boyfriend the guy loses his mind, texts me all kind of mean things about how I'm actually the ugliest girl he's ever seen, and he just felt bad for me and all this stuff. He even said he was going to come to my work and teach me a lesson for being a tease. I never answered, and he kept sending texts for days, until he must have realized I was not going to answer. I was paranoid going into work for like a year after that. Scared he would be there, but luckily, I never saw him again. This happened when I was in the second grade of elementary school. One night, my parents had to leave to attend a wake, and they left me home alone to house sit. They told me that I was in charge of the house. I was to eat dinner, take a shower, and go to bed. They said that they would be back after midnight. I'd never been alone in the house before. It was really strange, but I wanted to enjoy this newfound freedom. So I was watching TV and feeling really powerful as I could choose whichever channel I wanted. We live in the rural countryside of Kyushu. Our neighbors are a couple of minutes away, so nights are usually very calm and quiet. I think it was about 8 or 9 o'clock. I had just finished watching a TV show and the news came up. Boring, I thought. I guess it was time to take a shower and hit the hay. I was contemplating this massive decision while reading a manga comic laying down on the bed. Then, I heard a knock at the door. Oh, my parents came back early, I thought, as I went at the door. I looked through the frosted glass, and I saw the big shadow of a person there. My mom was only around four foot nine, so it couldn't have been her. Maybe it's my dad, I assumed. I called out. Hello? A deep male voice replied. Hi, little girl. Is your dad home? My dad was a bit of a drinker, and he often hung out with booze hounds. I thought that this might have been one of his pals or something, so I carelessly responded. No, he's not here. He's at a funeral. There was a short pause. And what about your mother? I didn't know what to say. I knew my mom hung out with her friends and they went drinking too, so maybe this guy knew both of them, but something told me not to reply. I felt a bit suspicious. What do I do? I thought that no matter what I would answer with, I might end up making another mistake or getting into trouble somehow. Mom's not home either, the voice persisted. This was so strange. We never usually had people coming to the house at this time of night. This wasn't right. There was something about his voice too. It didn't sound like the local accent. 
This wasn't good. I felt extremely anxious, and I couldn't bring myself to say anything in response. Are you alone in there, little girl? I began to cry silent tears while standing still and silent. Can't you open the door for me? I have something I have to give to your dad. I'm just here to drop it off. He said in a voice so extremely sickly, the kind of voice you hear when you're trying to coax someone into doing something. I mustered up enough strength to reply, can you come back tomorrow? He didn't reply, he just started to violently turn the doorknob. I understood this man's intentions now, and it felt like an arrow of ice went through my heart. My throat closed up and I couldn't breathe, I couldn't scream. Then came the sound of his fist, punching the frosted glass. Open it, he roared again and again. Please stop, I pleaded. It's so loud, I said. Then my brain kicked into gear, and I ran into the living room and grabbed the house phone. I didn't even know the number of the place where my parents were at. My parents had told me about people who would call the police when they don't need their help. Hoax calls. I was nervous, thinking I might get into trouble for one of these calls. While I was panicking about what to do, I heard the glass shatter in the hallway. He had breached the door. A horrible, thick arm shot through the hole. I remember he was wearing a jet black jumper. I screamed for help. I remember thinking this was more like a scene from a movie, not from real life. The arm was searching for the lock. While the arm was desperately probing for the lock, I heard another scream coming from outside. It was someone shouting my name. Someone shouting that they called the police. I wandered over to the door and I saw the owner of the new voice. I jumped for joy. It was the voice of the older lady who lived next door. She had heard all the commotion and came to see what was going on. As she shouted that she called the police, the man ran for it. I let her in. I was inconsolable. I just bawled my eyes out the whole night through. The police arrived about 30 minutes before my parents came back. When my parents did come back, they apologized again and again for leaving me by myself. In the end, we didn't know who the intruder was. My dad assumed it was a robbery attempt. Just as a side note, our town is located along the East China Sea in Kyushu, and there are a lot of suspicious ships around the ports. In addition, my hometown is famed for many unsolved missing person cases. We never found the man, but I often replay that moment in my head over and over. Thanks to that man, I have had countless sleepless nights. I don't like to think about what might have happened to me, if my neighbor hadn't been there. We've become very close with our neighbors after this, and my parents never let me house it again. I'm 17 years old and from Canada. Where I live is quite isolated. Not isolated to the point where I'm in the middle of nowhere, but there aren't many people in my town. A few months ago, this really old couple who had been our neighbors since I was born were moved into a care home and the house was put up for sale. My dad had a friend at the house selling firm, so he knew when it got sold. It was sold about a month after they moved out. My mom and dad were working, but I was at home, being as the whole pandemic thing caused me to get homeschooled. Someone knocked at my door. I'm not really a fan of social interactions, especially when home alone. Because believe me, I've watched enough scary shit to know. After about four knocks, I knew they wouldn't stop, so I went downstairs and opened the door. But I made sure I was still on the phone call to my friend, and I made it clear I was talking to someone, as when I answered I said, Give me a second, Hunter. Just as a precaution. I answered the door to an older guy. He looked rough, but a type of rough that was well-groomed, if that makes any sense. I said what's up, and he explained that he's the new neighbor. I didn't know what to say, so I was just like, Oh hey, what's up? He asked if he could come in, because it was snowing pretty bad outside. 
He just came up to inspect his property, knowing my mom would shout at me if I got off on the wrong foot with the new neighbor. I let him in. He just sat on the sofa while we talked. He had questions about the neighborhood. After about 10 minutes, he asked if he could use the bathroom and then said he would be on his way. I said, sure, it's upstairs on the left. He went up and I was still on the phone to my friend. He was up there for about 5 minutes, so I shouted up. Hey, are you okay? Not that I was concerned. I just wanted this guy gone. He replied, Yeah, it's all smooth sailing up here. Or something like that. When he came down, he wasn't wearing his jacket anymore. Instead, he had rolled it into a ball in his hands. At the time, I didn't take note. But the more I think about it, the more sense it makes. I see him out and say goodbye. And that's that. I talk to my friend on FaceTime and then go upstairs to my room. Now, I have OCD, so I know I'd never leave my door open just a bit. I think to myself, what has this guy done as I look around? The only thing I noticed that was out of place was my drawer. The middle one was just a bit open too. I check it and all my underwear is gone. I check my dirty laundry basket behind my door. All of my dirty underwear are gone from that too. I call my mom and ask her about the underwear and if she's done some laundry. She said no. I freak out and I call my dad and ask him about the neighbors. He says, Oh yeah, I've spoken to the dad. British guy. Lovely fella. My heart sunk as I realized I let a random guy in my house. And God knows why he wanted my underwear. I haven't seen him since and I haven't told my parents about it as it's pretty embarrassing. It only adds fuel to my mom's argument that I can't go to college, as I'm too immature and unable to take care of myself. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and studying in Paris, France. I was going home from uni. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way home. That day, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking at me intensely. I was used to unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time, his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like prey being stalked. I decided to get off the bus a few stops early. I wanted to avoid him and didn't want him to see where I usually got off. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button, and waited until the last moment to stand up and leave. I didn't notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was feeling the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I looked over my shoulder, and there he was, a few meters behind me. I had the distressing feeling his eye had just looked away the moment I turned. I walked into a shop took my phone out and pretended to make a call. When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited and made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back in the busy street. I zigzagged, crossed the street at every crossing. Finally, I believed that him getting off at the same stop as me was just a coincidence. When I reached my building, I looked back one last time, and there he was. His alarming gaze on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbed the stairs four at a time. I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, locked it and froze. My intercom was ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed all the buttons one by one, hoping someone would open. But now, now he knew my name. Gabrielle. Oh shit. I felt like a deer in the headlights. Frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just want to talk to you. Somehow, I could not move or speak. Come to the window, he added. Look at me. You'll see. I am not a bad guy. Something clicked. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. 
I was not going to make that mistake. I hung up in shock. I waited by the door without moving for what seemed like hours. When I finally managed to calm myself, I called my long-distance boyfriend. Call the police, he said immediately. Why didn't I call the police? I don't know. Today, it would be the first thing I would do. The fear of making a big deal out of something not important, perhaps. What an idiot I was. I called my best friend instead. I didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while I felt better, safe. We started laughing, and suddenly the intercom rang again. Two hours had passed since I'd come home. I answered. Gabrielle, said the voice. Open, please. I still remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He was there all this time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabrielle, let me in. I am so thirsty, he said. Just give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. Curled up in a corner in the recovery position, terrified, I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared to even breathe. The intercom rang again, and again. I didn't answer this time. I crawled to the sofa and fell asleep in exhaustion. I heard the intercom ring one more time in the middle of the night. I woke up in the morning, afraid to leave my apartment. I called my dad, who came to pick me up. There was no one in the hall. But there was a note in my mailbox. Gabrielle, I am a nice guy. You should have opened to me. Was written down on the note. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened and of course told me that I should not hesitate to call them. My dad called a locksmith to install a digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors, asking not to open the door to anyone they did not expect. He sat in the cafe in the front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. I never saw that stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from uni every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand and looked back every few meters. Today, I am still very observing of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I'm not expecting someone. So, people, if you find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be an idiot like me. Be safe, everyone. For almost a few years now, end of August 2019 to be exact, I had moved into an apartment in a different city because my mother who I lived with in my hometown passed away from cancer. I have moved here with my long-term boyfriend and one other roommate. We all absolutely love it here. The location is great. It's a 15-minute bike ride from my university and it's located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms and that kind of thing. So we have pretty much everything we could possibly need to survive within walking distance. However, after just a month or two of living here, someone has started to ring my doorbell at exactly 11.05 p.m. semi-regularly. Sometimes every day, sometimes every other day. Sometimes there's a week in between, and sometimes there's a couple of weeks in between. But it is always around 11.05 p.m., and every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is. Except for one time, but I will get to that in a bit. At first, I thought it was friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell. But after around the fourth time, I grew suspicious. And after more than those four times, I started noticing that it always happens at either exactly 11.05pm or a couple minutes earlier or later. My boyfriend and my roommate both work at bars so they work until very late and would usually only get home around 2am. So each time it happened, 
I was always alone at home. It started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they kind of shrugged it off and said it was probably a wrong dial, much like I thought at first. But when I told them that it has happened so many times, and sometimes even daily, they didn't really believe me and that I was just being paranoid and spooked. However, one night, when the doorbell rang again, I answered the intercom asking who it was. I heard heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked at that moment. I was again home alone and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't make up from the breathing if it was a man or a woman, but I heard a strange mumbling or whispering, and then it was dead silent. They had appeared to have left. I put my apartment door on a double lock after that. I was so scared and spooked out. Thankfully, my roommate got home a little earlier that night, Around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang, he could tell how upset I was. Now with the whole pandemic crisis, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore. They now also witness the frequent door ringing at 11.05pm, so now they do believe me and agree that it's very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down at where our apartment building's main front door is, but because there's a shop underneath us that always has the awning out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend and roommate would go over to the balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. I've also asked my neighbors from my apartment building if their doorbell gets rang so often, but the ones that I asked all said it's never happened to them. So a few weeks ago, my roommate decided to do some investigating. He went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m standing across the street. He pretended to have a smoke while keeping an eye on the door. He said he did see a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building. He slowed his pace down significantly as soon as he approached our door, but when he spotted my roommate looking at him, he quickly walked away. We aren't completely sure if that's the door ringer, but that was very, very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't gone off at night since that day. I'm hoping that maybe it will stop now, but there is a possibility that it will continue again in a few weeks. This all happened roughly five years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it's happened. I'll start off by saying that at the time I was pretty young, single, and very keen to have my first experience with a guy. I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people, until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting. We had a lot of things in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with them, since we had been talking for almost a month. Now, even though I was only young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was, and still am, a very cautious and paranoid person, but for some reason that day, I made what possibly could have been one of the worst decisions of my life. I invited him to come spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend, and I had the place to myself. It seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over, he lived around three to four hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to come see me, so he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11am. The whole time he was driving to my place, I had the sickening sense of doom, almost as if something was going to go very wrong. I almost texted him a couple of times to tell him I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. I jumped up as I heard his car pull up, and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door, but he pushed his way through and continued to stare at me blankly, all whilst my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never, ever do to anyone. Things instantly seemed extremely odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me, which I hesitantly went along with as this was my first experience with a guy, especially as he was almost six years older than me, 
so I was pretty tense. Fast forward to a couple of hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which did confuse me as it was only 5pm, but I told him it was fine and I would continue to watch movies by myself downstairs. After an hour or two, I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around and the sound of him talking, so I made my way upstairs and opened my door to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed, where he sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes and put his hands lightly around my neck. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, which worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat and said, Does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am? or what I look like or anything. I instantly answered, saying that my sister and friends who live nearby knew. This was a complete lie, as I don't have a sister, and my friends were unaware, but something inside of me forced me to say it. After a few minutes of awkward silence, he stood up, gathered his things, and I noticed that in his backpack he had tape, rope, and handcuffs which at first didn't concern me, as I knew he was into that stuff, but I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden he said, I think I'm gonna head home. I have a long drive and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate to let him out of my front door, as I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to make any eye contact or say goodbye. He raced off down the street, as soon as he got into his car. I ran back to my room to check if he had left anything, as he left in a hurry, and I found a note on my desk, with the words, Being nice is what saved you. At the time I had no idea what the note meant, but now that I think about it, I seriously think that he had very ill intentions toward me. I'm still angry at myself for even letting a stranger into my home, which is obviously a big mistake. I immediately blocked him on all of my social media. I'm just so lucky I made it out alive. All I know is that he's somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say now is that I'm glad that he's many miles away from me. I recently just moved into a new apartment with my boyfriend. We'd been living here for a few months now. I was really excited to move out because my old apartment was really old and falling apart, and I also hated my neighbors, so I was really looking forward to moving. When we first moved into the apartment, something seemed off right away from the start. It felt like someone was watching me when I was in the shower or in a room by myself or I would hear footsteps in a room that no one was in. I didn't think much of it, I just thought it was my imagination getting to me, being that I was in a new apartment. Now I don't really believe in the paranormal, but after this incident, I'm starting to believe that we're not the only ones living here. My boyfriend was at work when this happened to me. I'd been watching scary movies all day, so I was a bit scared to be in the new apartment alone. I was sitting on my bed watching a scary movie with my two cats when I heard a knock. I thought it was just in the movie, so I kept watching when I heard it again. Only this time, it was a bit louder. I paused my show and went to go check if my boyfriend got home early, looking to see if I locked him out by accident. I went to check my front door, but he wasn't there. I went back to my room and saw that my cat Nova was looking at something. She was staring the closet with wide eyes. You should know that my cat is a very friendly cat. I'd had her for a year, and she's the most lovable cat, and has never showed any aggression towards me or my boyfriend. Nova was hissing and meowing very loudly at the closet door. I was really scared after I saw her act this way. I've never seen her act like that before. 
I just tried to calm her down a bit and pet her the best I could. When I looked over at the closet, I saw it shaking as if someone was holding the door handles really tight. It was like they were shaking it up and down really fast. I was so freaked out at this point, I froze, because I couldn't believe what I just saw. It wasn't just me, but both my cats were acting strange. Nova was in the middle of the bed, looking around, still hissing and meowing like crazy. Her head was moving side to side almost as if someone was walking around the bed. When I told my boyfriend about this, he was a bit freaked out, and then he told me that he also felt as if someone was watching him in the shower. I never told him that I also felt that. This happened in 2007 when I was 19. I was attending college in a very safe southern town with a population of about 30,000. I was lucky enough to have a modest place to myself because my family owned property in a suburban area that they no longer used. The house was very small, but it sat in the middle of a two-acre fenced-in lot with a lot of pine trees and shrubbery. So, Saturday night some friends picked me up and we went to a few parties, hung out at their house, nothing major. They dropped me back off at my house at around 1am. I had two dogs that usually sleep in my room. But this night, they were being restless, so I put them in the living room and closed my bedroom door so they couldn't keep bothering me. I immediately fell asleep. A few hours later, I woke up and I saw a man climbing in my bedroom window through the shades. My bed was pushed completely up against the wall by the window, so by the time I saw him, he had already had a knife at my throat and his hand over my mouth. I don't think I intentionally left this window unlocked but I'm a 5'11 girl, and it was almost out of my reach from the ground. It was also incredibly narrow, like maybe one and a half foot high and three foot across. It never came across my mind that someone would break in through that window. My first feeling was absolute rage. I remember that more than anything. I could instantly tell I had no idea who he was. His cheeks were really hollowed out, and he was very thin. He was also older than me maybe in his thirties. He said, if you don't scream, I won't kill you. His voice was so calm. I remember later thinking that his tone was so normal, we could have been discussing the fucking weather. He took his hand off of my mouth that was now bleeding from his fingernails. I told him I had money I could give him. He could have my car. I just started rambling on about any possessions I could think of, and he said, that's not what I'm here for. To cut the conversation short, this lunatic held me down for probably five minutes, just talking to me. I asked him things like how he knew I was there. He said it was a lucky guess. By then, my dog started freaking out in the living room, and he seemed to get a little unnerved. He became more serious, started groping me, and told me to lay down. When he let me go for just a second, I was able to push him off and dive head first out of my window. When I fell, I landed on a metal lawn chair that he drug up from my yard. I was only sleeping in my underwear when this happened, so in addition to the scrapes on my mouth, my whole body got pretty bruised and scuffed up from the fall. I immediately got up and ran as fast as I could to my neighbor's house, who happened to be a state trooper. Time has never been slower than it was when I was standing outside banging on his front door. When he answered the door, I told him what happened. He grabbed a bulletproof vest, a gun, and ran towards my house. His wife called 911, gave me some clothes, and helped me clean up a bit. Running had taken a layer of skin off the bottom of my feet, and I had left bloody footprints on their carpet. They never found out who it was. My friends that dropped me off said they saw a man with red hair walking down my road. It was too dark in my room for me to know what his hair color was. I could tell that he was left-handed by the way he held the knife. The police were beyond unhelpful. They only told me that he had had to have been watching me for a while to know that I lived there alone and what room was mine. A couple of years later, a man was arrested for a previously unsolved sexual assault and murder in 2005 of a girl a few miles from my place. 
He was never charged with anything relating to the murder in 2005, but DNA was able to place him. He lived in her building. He had red hair and was left-handed. Lock your windows and trust your dog. I'm an only child. It was about six in the morning on a Sunday, and I was in my living room watching cartoons with both my parents asleep when I hear a knock at the door. It was a pretty woman in her thirties, holding a large cardboard box. I'd never seen her before. There was a big white van pulled up in the street in front of my house, with a man in the driver's seat. She told me the box is for my parents, and asked if they were home. I told her yes, but they're asleep. She said, Oh, that's okay. I can come back later. But that she has something for me too, and it's in the car. She asks if I could come out and help her get it out. I'm lucky because I just started kindergarten, and we just had the stranger danger talk just a couple of days before. I said to her, Maybe later when my parents are awake. Goodbye. And I shut the door. Immediately I told my parents, and they didn't believe me. A couple of years later, I told them the exact same story, and they realized I did not make it up. To this day, they have no idea who that woman could possibly be based on my description. My dad had a meth addiction at the time, and hung out with a lot of questionable people, so I wonder if word spread around that he had a daughter, or that maybe someone had just happened to notice by watching the house. I'll never know, but they never came back. I believe I was about 16 when this took place, and it was in sixth form college here in the UK, so I'm guessing it was in the spring or summer of 2001. It was either a Friday or Saturday night when I got a text asking what I was up to and if I wanted to go out. I had no idea who the text was from as the number wasn't saved in my phone and didn't have a name at the end of the text. I text back and got a call. Picking it up, I hear my friend Ong's voice. I was happy to hear from her as we went to secondary school together. I went on to college and she decided to do other things so we didn't see each other regularly anymore. She didn't have social media and refused to have a mobile phone. I praised her for finally getting with it and getting a phone. She burst my bubble when she said it was her friends. We had a quick chat. It was probably about 10 p.m. I couldn't be asked to get ready, so I declined and said another time. Around 12 a.m., I got another text. I thought she was contacting me again. The text read something along the lines of, Hey, this is Daniel, Ong's friend. I'm bored and stuck here till Ong wants to leave. I hope you don't mind me texting you. I didn't. At this age, I used to be up till stupid o'clock on the internet, and as he was a friend of my friend, I didn't see a problem. So he texted me for a bit, and it was kind of a nothingness conversation. Around 2am or so, I get a call. It's him. He said I sounded nice and that he wanted to have a chat with me. Okay, cool. I'm still wide awake, so we had a chat. It was alright. We had a laugh, talked about nothing much for a while, then said goodbye. The next morning, I get a text from him. I reply. He texts me all day and rings me again later. I find out more about him, that he works in the local shopping center in a certain store I went to all the time. The kind of stuff he likes, which is nothing like me, but whatever. We talk about where we live, as we live in different towns about 20 minutes apart by bus. At this point, he knows what I look like, as Ong had showed him photos of us she had, but he also saw my Friendster page, which had current pictures of me. He, like Ong, didn't have social media back then, so I had no idea what he looked like, but he described himself. I didn't really care what he looked like, as I wasn't interested like that, but I had no problem in chatting to him. So this carries on for a week or two. 
him texting me and calling me to find out about me, asking lots of questions, which at the time seemed harmless enough. Around this time, I had time off of college for Easter holidays. He starts saying we should meet up as both of us are free. I tell him I can't as I have some coursework to do. This was only half true. I did have classwork to do, but I always leave it till the last minute. I was just busy being lazy and sitting about the house. He clearly didn't get the message as he started texting me constantly. If I didn't reply to him fast enough, he sent more messages and would call. I told him I was so busy trying to do classwork that when I have time, I will text him. After a few days of that, I got a message saying, I had to go do something in your area. Let's meet. I told him I was busy and couldn't. He said that was okay, but then kept bombarding me with texts, urging me to meet him. No. Two days later, I get a message from him saying he's in my area again. We have to meet. No. The end of that week, he is there again, and once more, my answer is no. The start of the next week, he goes on about being in my area again. I ignore the text this time. Later that day, I get a call from a local area number. I pick up, and it's him. He says he's here and wants to hang out, and that I didn't reply to his text. I tell him I'm not at home and I've been flat out, and I say once again that I will text him when I'm free. I found out the number he called from was a public telephone box on the main road that connects to the road that I live on. The constant texts were annoying, but I let them slide as I had no intention on meeting him. It was only a text, but to find out that he was actually literally in my area and knew round about where I lived, all the questions he was asking before that seemed harmless, all made sense now. He was narrowing down where I lived to the street, as I have a college at the bottom of my road and a park at the top. He knew this. He knew what bus I got from college and the stop I got off at which further narrows down the part of the street I lived on. He used to ask things about the clothes I wore and accessories I had, what patches were on my backpack and that kind of thing, so he would definitely know it was me if he saw me. Now this was not cool at all. I told him I'm not meeting him anytime soon, that I'm busy and he needs to chill the hell out as I don't need the hassle. This really put me off wanting to speak to him, as it was all fucking weird and I really should have told him to fuck off at this point. But when you don't really care about the person, other than to have a chat with, I just thought if I lessened the contact, he would get bored and piss off of his own accord. School started again, and I felt safer knowing that he couldn't be in my area when he had college quite far away from me. There would be no chance that I would run into him, except for the shop I usually went to, which was near my college. I avoided going there, as there was nothing in there I couldn't get elsewhere. I really didn't want to go into the shopping center unless I had to, and that would be during school lunchtime, so he wouldn't be there. This wasn't because I was scared. I just didn't ever want to meet him, and I was starting to get pissed off the more I thought about it, and I didn't want to be nasty to him. So the texts continued. Over the next few weeks, I wouldn't reply to the majority of them, and when I did, they were polite. I stated that as I had exams soon, I didn't want the distraction. I then started to ignore his messages. They didn't stop. Another phone number I didn't know texted me. I asked who it was, and of course it was him from his mom's phone. He was really pissed off I replied to that text and not his. This was becoming a joke. During this time, one Saturday night, my mom rang me as I was coming home from a gig. She told me a boy I went to primary school called Morley rang to speak to me today. He asked if he could call again, and before the call ended, he also asked if I had a boyfriend. I was confused. Morley used to like me back in primary school, but we hadn't spoken since we left school at 11. Our moms did still chat occasionally, so I had no clue what the hell that was about. I get a call from Morley the next day. He tells me he's sorry for ringing me, but he really needs to ask me a question. He asked me if I had a boyfriend. I said I didn't. 
He then asked me if I knew someone called Daniel. I said yes, that I'd been speaking to someone called Daniel, but what started out as a pleasant chat and some texts had turned into way too much. He then went to tell me that Daniel goes to his sixth form and is loosely associated with his friend group. No one really likes him. Boys being boys, they were talking about girls. Daniel went on to talk about his girlfriend. They asked questions about her, and he told them who she was, what she looked like, what she was into, where she lived, and that kind of thing. He didn't think much of it. When he came back to school after the holidays, he had a bunch of clothes in his bag. They asked him where he was going, being as they wear uniform at their sixth floor. He was bragging about how he'd come straight from hers as he stayed around her house a lot during the holiday. He told them in detail how he slept with her and got up to all sorts. He used to entertain them with stories all about her, and after a while, he finally showed them her picture. It was my picture. Morley was livid on the phone. He said the stuff Daniel was saying that we had done was just plain nasty, and the stuff he was saying about me he didn't think was true. He wanted to confirm that. He told me he would ring me back in a few days. Daniel was still trying to speak to me. After hearing from Morley what he'd been up to, I'm clearly not going to answer. I set the number to divert. I don't know if you could block numbers back then, but if you could, I didn't know how. I ignored the messages he sent me. I didn't even open them. I got home from school Monday afternoon at about 6 o'clock, and I got a call from Morley, who again was pissed off, but was delighted. He told me he just got home and that Daniel had come into school with clothes in his bag again that morning. He said how he'd been staying at mine and that we slept together again. At that point, Morley, in front of everyone, said, You have never been to her house. And of course Daniel was adamant that he had. Morley replied, It must have been a Wendy house, as he knows for certain that he has never been to my house. He told Daniel that he knew me, and had spoken to me yesterday, confirming that I am not his girlfriend. He brought up the fact that he has never met me, he's only spoken to me, and how I refused to meet him. I have been pretty much ignoring him as he kept turning up where I lived to try and spot me. This did not go down well, obviously, as he had been made to look like a complete fucking twat. That night, my phone wouldn't stop with texts and calls from his number. He wouldn't stop calling. I told my mom everything after Morley called, as she wanted to know what it was about. At 11pm, Daniel called again. I gave the phone to my mom, and she picked up. He was sounding all in a panic, saying he needed to talk to me. She said no, that I was in bed, and it was inappropriate to call at this time. Not only that, but to not call me ever again. The number was put on divert, and I was still getting voicemails. I texted him and told him to leave me alone, that it really is enough now. I know what he did, and that I don't want to know him. He went quiet till around 2 a.m where he started calling again from a third number. I was asleep and my mom was awake. The call woke me up, so I called her in. She picked up the phone and went mental at him. She said she knows all about it and to leave me alone, or there will be trouble. He still texted after that. My mom was beyond livid, and at 6am, she rang his mom's mobile, woke her up, and told her all about what her son was up to. She was initially pissed off to be woken up so early, but when my mom laid it out, she just went quiet and said, I'm sorry, I will deal with it. I didn't hear from him again after that. On called me. I hadn't spoken to her since that first night, probably just over a month ago. She said she found out what had happened, I think from his mom. She wanted to know the validity of the call she received, and was so incredibly sorry. She said that he wasn't even really her friend. They knew each other from primary school, and he lived close. That he just turned up at her house and imposed himself on her. Her mom would always let him in, despite her warning her not to, as she was fond of him. So Ong just put up with it. She did say in the past, when he was in secondary school, he became obsessed with a girl in their area, and used to effectively stalk her. 
The mother of that girl complained to his mom, but his mom just thought he was young then and didn't think he did stuff like that anymore. Clearly, he didn't change. So, Daniel, for a 17-year-old, you were a fucking wronger. I dread to think what you're like now. I lived in North Carolina for the past 10 years of my life, mainly in one of the big cities. I used to live in a not-so-great area of the city. It was so bad that I got sexually assaulted and one of my neighbors got murdered, so I'm used to the not-so-friendly people in the not-best-of-places. Around seven years ago, my parents got better jobs in a different part of the city and I went to a school in the same area, and it's a lot nicer. I feel safe enough to chill outside late at night, and everyone is pretty friendly. Still, we're cautious. I'm trained in karate, my dad owns two shotguns, and we have a 130 pound American Akita named Jax. Honestly, he's scary looking, but he's a big baby. There's a neighborhood cat he's best friends with, and he cries when people don't pet him. But he can be scary. The first time he barked, I nearly shit my pants. Because he's so big, people tend to stop and ask about him when I'm walking him. They'll come up and ask the typical questions about what breed he is, how much he weighs, and all that stuff. He normally sits there and loves the attention. Everyone in my neighborhood is friendly for the most part, and they know me as the girl with the gigantic dog. One evening in mid-June, I'm walking Jacks and listening to my music. When we cross the road, and this guy is parking in his driveway. He's older, probably in his mid-forties, and he waves at us. I wave back and try to continue on my way, but he approaches me. I groan internally and yank out my earphones as he walks over, all smiles. What kind of dog you got there? He asks. And I notice he's covered in what looks like engine oil. An American Akita, I respond trying to keep it short and simple so I can get back home and eat dinner, but this man keeps talking. Jesus, he's a big one. How old is he? He asks, and I tell him he's six years old and that he was born on Christmas. The man nods and smiles, and I notice that something is up. Jax, for once, is not sitting down and wagging his tail, begging for attention. Instead, He's pulling on his leash and trying to drag me away. I assume he just wants to finish his walk, so I tell the man bye and turn to walk away when he yells after me. Wait, can I buy your dog? He asks. I'll give you $600. I turn around and look at him with a shocked look on my face. Until then, no one had ever asked to buy my dog from me. Sorry, I stammered out. He's not for sale. I tell him and Jax is still tugging on his leash. I'm starting to get creeped out. Who just asks to buy someone's pet from them on the street? The man frowns and crosses his arms. Ah, uh, well, do you want some vodka? He asks. Sir, I'm 17, I tell him, starting to back away. He laughs and shakes his head. Come on, I won't tell. Loosen up a bit, girl, he says and he grabs my arm and starts pulling on me. Just then, Jax comes whipping around and starts barking like mad. This guy lets go and starts cursing at me, and Jax is still losing it. I've got tears in my eyes and I start running up the street back to my house, dragging Jax with me who's still barking. At this point, his really deep and animalistic bark has attracted the attention of all the other dogs in the neighborhood. And as I'm running about two blocks to my house, there's about a dozen dogs barking in their yards and houses. I got home, locked the door, and told my mother what happened, while Jack stood at the window for a good 30 minutes, just staring at the street. It's been a year since that happened, and I don't walk Jack's that way anymore, but I did notice that the house has been foreclosed on. This happened to me around the age of 10, and it still makes me feel uneasy. My parents were out of town, and my brother, who was five years older than me, was supposed to be watching me. Yeah, 
that didn't happen. So he's out doing God knows what while I'm home alone watching TV in the basement. There are two windows in the living room basement. It probably didn't help that I was watching America's Most Wanted and freaking myself out. Suddenly, I hear the gate to the backyard, which is near me in the house, open. I think, that's odd. Why is my brother coming around the back? This was long before cell phones, by the way, so I can't text him to see what's going on. I see these massive feet, huge boots, slowly walking in the first window closest to me. I immediately feel uneasy. I turn off the TV so I can hear and see better. My heart is pounding. I hear someone move along the side of the backyard, and now I see the same massive feet in the second window. They paused. I am terrified. I wonder if my brother is pranking me, but I'm too scared to be mad, and they seemed way too big. The boots keep moving. I don't hear or say anything because I'm frozen with fear. I now hear someone coming down the basement steps, towards the basement door next to me. I hear the rattle of the knob, but the door is locked. I hear a pound on the door. I'm so freaked out but I lay there silently. A few seconds go by and it's quiet. Then I hear the footsteps go up the stairs. I know this guy is still in the backyard somewhere, but I don't know what to do. I hear the footsteps going up another set of steps toward the upstairs back door. Same thing again. Rattle of the knob and banging. Then the steps coming around the side of the house closest to me. This part is the freakiest. The boots stop at the window closest to me, and I see his knees bend to crouch down and look in the window. I was so scared that I threw my blanket over my whole body, hoping I'd just disappear. It was quiet for some time, and I didn't dare move. I am certain he was looking at me from above, and felt that uncanny feeling of being watched. Moments later, I heard the gate shut, and he was gone. I have no idea what would have happened if one of those doors were unlocked. I'm still pissed at my asshole of a brother for leaving me alone that night. Back when I was in college, I had a group of three friends who I hung out with, and I'm pretty sure we were a massive nuisance for most of the tutors and stuff, because we pissed about non-stop. We took nothing seriously, and were constantly getting mixed up in things we shouldn't have. Rewind back to my first year. Our college was in a pretty rural area, off the roads quite a bit, and surrounded mostly by fields. Me and one of my friends, Adrian, waltzed on down to the far reaches of the college and climbed on top of one of the old equipment sheds, and then on top of one of those concrete squared buildings that holds the generators. We saw a guy in the distance hopping over one of the fences. He looked pretty old and not like someone from our college. We just kind of sat up there, using it as a vantage point to each lunch, and we were watching this guy. He makes eye contact with us and starts coming over. He climbed the same bit we were on, hopped up and just said, hey, and grinned at us. He stank and ended up sitting right next to my friend, uncomfortably close. We both looked at each other, and together, hopped down off the thing. We started walking back to the college building without saying anything. He started shouting at us, saying, Hey, where are you guys going? But we just kind of blanked him and kept on going. We told the tutors when we got back, but they didn't believe us. They just assumed we were messing about as usual. And then one of the tutors called John gave us a lecture about climbing on top of things and health and safety. So, yeah, I have no idea who this guy was, or what that whole thing was about. About six years ago, I was working at Target as asset protection. About an hour before my shift ended, I was walking around the store on a slow weeknight. There were not many customers. Once I finished my shift, 
I went to the grocery area to get a few things. While I was at the register, waiting to check out, I see this man standing between the entrance and exit. He was looking at me. We made eye contact. I realized that I saw this man earlier and that he'd been in the store for a long time. He had no bag or anything. He was just standing there. I thought it was weird, but not too weird, since some people will be there just to kill time. I look over at him again while I'm checking out. He was now by the bathrooms, but he was still looking at me. After I check out, I'm walking towards the exit, and as I'm about to enter the vestibule, the man is right beside me, slightly behind, almost touching me. He starts talking to me about the weather, and at this point I'm weirded out. Once we're outside, he asks me if I'm walking to my car. He's still walking, almost touching me, still making small talk. Then he grabs my elbow with his left hand and puts his other hand in his jacket pocket. I immediately turn around and say I forgot something inside the store, and I walk back inside. I told the leader on duty and stayed in the store for another 30 minutes. I asked her to walk with me to my car. The next day, I went on the cameras to see when the guy came in, and when he went after our interaction, I could see a bulge in his right pocket from the footage of him entering. He was in the store for over an hour, and I realized, watching the footage, that he was always in the area I was in within the last 30 minutes or so of my shift. Before that, he was in the women's purses area, looking like he was watching people. He wasn't looking at the merchandise. His car was one spot away from mine, which was weird because employees had to park farther away from the store. It wasn't busy, and there were a lot of spots closer to the store. I could see myself turn around on camera and walk back towards the store. He walked quickly to his car and left immediately. I don't know what he was doing or what he was reaching for in his pocket. I'm tall for a woman, and this guy was quite a bit shorter than me which I think is why I didn't perceive him as much of a threat initially. He was older too, early to mid-fifties. This happened last year around mid-May. I had just got home from getting my son his first haircut. I had just laid him down for a nap in his crib and laid down in my bed myself. I heard the front door handle rattle. I never locked my door during the day, but today I had, which is so strange, I don't even remember doing it. It rattled a few more times. My window in my room that is level with the head of the bed faces the porch. So I peeked out and I saw a really tall guy trying to peer in my other window. Then he just sat in the chair I have on my porch, literally right by my window that my head was next to. I honestly did not hesitate to call the police, because I don't own a gun and my baby was in the home. I didn't want to risk being confrontational. After about six minutes on the phone with the dispatcher, whispering the details to her, a police officer came. He tried to run and they arrested him. I was later told he had a warrant for burglary. I am a 28-year-old male living in the deep south. I am a functional, medicated, and therapy-attending paranoid schizophrenic. However, I wasn't always this way, and this story comes from a time before I even knew what was wrong. It was about April 2007 when this happened. I had just come out of a painful divorce. She had taken all of my friends away from me in the process. I was, obviously trying to reach out to anyone I could, but I had severe codependency issues that I didn't know how to address. Anyway, I found myself wandering the game section of my local Walmart. As I am still a gamer at heart, I had to see what was available. Things were going alright. I seemed to be in control of myself. Then he appeared. This poor, unsuspecting soul started talking to me about World of Warcraft which I happened to play. I perked up at this point, thinking I could make a friend, a new friend that hadn't been taken from me. 
We made casual jokes and talked about the new expansion. At this point his mother came by and took him to another aisle. He didn't say goodbye, he just walked off. And just like that, our conversation was through. Well, in my mind, we had made a connection. We had bonded. In my sick, twisted state, I thought he would appreciate if we hung out for a while, so I followed him. I made a point to casually stroll down the aisles that he happened to visit, and strike up conversations with him about different things. Jokes, I can't remember. I could tell he was getting creeped out by the third time I'd done this. He started getting this deer-in-the-headlights look every time he saw me, and it was starting to become a horror story. Though, in my eyes, it was perfectly natural. At some point, however, his fight or flight must have kicked in, because when I appeared, as soon as I opened my mouth to speak, he screamed, Leave me alone, and stormed off dragging his mother as quickly as he possibly could. This was a wake-up call for me, that I was being severely creepy and also a stalker. I realized that this could very well be the behavior that caused my divorce in the first place. I checked myself into a mental institution soon after, and I got the help I needed. I am now significantly better, and my relationships with people have improved greatly. I now have good friends and a loving fiancé. Not all creepers mean to be creepy. Some of us just need the proper psychiatric help. On behalf of all the unknowing and good-intentioned creepers out there, I humbly and sincerely apologize for our behavior. It doesn't make it forgivable, but I hope it does give some context as to what goes on in the mind of a creeper. Thank you for your time. This was the first and only time I ever used my emergency code with my mom. My dad was in a band, and some of his band members were in a country band that had a performance on the 4th of July. It was taking place on a ranch-type area near a highway. When I got there, I quickly realized that everyone there was either 20 years older than me or 10 years younger. I was 17 at the time. And so I realized that I was most likely going to be bored there for three hours. One of the band members' wives brought over a girl who looked to be my age. She introduced her to me and treated her like a friend. The girl, Sarah, started talking with me and asked if I would like to go for a walk around the field. I agreed and we set off. We started talking about school and it turns out she's a year younger than me and that she was homeschooled. I told her that I went to an all-girls Catholic school, and she quickly started talking about how she thought most girls were pretty bitchy, and she was Catholic. She practiced witchcraft. I thought it was kind of weird, but I tried to be open-minded, so I wasn't judging her. We finally got to the side of the field that couldn't be seen by people at the event, but it was right next to the highway. There, we came across the body of a dead deer, she looked at me and said, I really wish I could take its hoof. I wonder if I have any bags on me. I thought she was joking, but she reached into her backpack and pulled out a knife and a brown paper bag. She went over to the dead deer and started sawing at its foot, but she couldn't get it all the way through. She tried to get me to help her, but I said no, so she put down the knife and ripped the hoof off with her bare hands. At this point, I was freaking out, because she'd just been talking about how she liked violence, and I didn't really care about people being hurt. She grabbed the hoof, put it in the bag, and then put that in her backpack. She was still carrying the knife. I tried messaging my mom, but there was no service where we were standing. We kept walking, and she was talking about how she would put curses on people she didn't like and how she was completely desensitized to death and the killing of animals because she'd grown up on a farm where she had watched her mother cut the heads off of rabbits. We kept walking and came across a fork in the road. She said we should go one way, and she said she wasn't going to chop me into pieces or anything because that doesn't happen much these days. We finally got to a place where there was cell service, 
and I texted my mom our code word. She told me to get back to the barbecue and we would leave right away. Sarah asked me when I had to leave. I told her that whenever my grandma got to our house, we would have to go home and meet her. I mentioned something about her bringing her dog named Buddy, and Sarah got excited about the name. She said she had a dog named Buddy, who she set free in the wild, and then he was eaten alive by coyotes, but it was okay because he died happy. We finally got back to where everyone else was, and my mom said that we needed to go home. Sarah then asked for my phone number as she had seen my phone. I agreed and put in a fake number before my parents and I walked away. As soon as we were out of sight, I ran to the car. My parents got into the car and asked me if she pulled out drugs or something. I wish. I would have known how to handle that. I woke up around 3 in the morning to my dog ferociously barking. It startled me awake because he only barks like that when someone he doesn't know is in the house. After a short while, he stops barking. We are both intently listening for any noises. My heart is beating as I hear clicking sounds coming from the living room. I am undecided if someone is in the house. I am thinking maybe it's the fridge, but this is a distinct noise. It was really windy that night, so I was also thinking perhaps the wind blew something loose, but this was coming from inside the house, and no windows were open. I lay in my bed, frigid, with my eyes wide open and ears listening hard. My dog eventually jumps back onto my bed and falls asleep. I keep my bedroom door locked so I felt a bit safe, especially with my dog. I figured if he says it's fine, and it probably is. I don't hear any more noises, and eventually I fall back asleep. The next morning, I examine the living room for any possible culprits of the noise. As I'm looking around, it suddenly dawns on me. The door. I remember the door handle makes a clicking sound when it's pushed down. To be sure, I go to my front door and push down the handle. What I hear is what I heard the previous night. That light clicking sound, discreet yet distinct, someone was trying to enter my house. I had an aunt who lived in Cleveland, Ohio, and worked for some sort of agency, helping convicted criminals rebuild their lives after getting out of jail. I don't know the name of the place she worked, but I know they were involved in employment to felons as well as lower criminals. My aunt worked directly with the clients, finding out the kinds of things they were qualified to do, what skills they might have, what they enjoyed, that kind of thing. She had a lot of experience talking to people who'd done terrible things in their lives, but she never judged them for it or assumed that they would continue their criminality. The agency had to check for the clients to see if they were genuinely interested in changing their lives, so most of them really just wanted help in becoming legitimate. She had one client who had a very hard time with transportation. He didn't live anywhere near a bus station and thus had a hard time getting to and from the agency as well as to any job. In the months that my aunt worked with this man, they became friendly and at one point, she offered to help him with transportation when she could. This is how she ended up picking him up and dropping him off at his house. I assume that whatever the job they found for this guy was close to where my aunt worked, so she would just take him on her way home. She said he was always nice enough, kind of quiet and eccentric, but nothing too strange. At one point, when she dropped him off, he invited her in for a drink or something, but their professional relationship disallowed her from doing so. After a while, this guy apparently got on his feet and left the agency, fending for himself. My aunt pretty much forgot about it. After some period of time, my aunt sees this guy's face on television. The police had stormed his house and found a horror show inside. He had murdered something like seven girls and women, hidden them beneath his floorboards. According to the forensics, his victims had been killed at different times 
ranging from the very recent to before my aunt had known him. So basically, this guy was actively killing at the time she was driving him to and from his house. I recently inherited my mom's estate after she died, and I began staying there. It's been a pain in the ass dealing with emptying it out to sell it while working full time, not to mention the hassle with the probate lawyers and my realtor. The icing on the cake has been dealing with this old woman living in the neighboring house. The first instance where I realized there was probably something wrong with her mentally was when she came onto my driveway to talk while I was filling up a rented dumpster with some junk from inside the house. She's going on and on about a plastic baton she gave to my little sister when she was a toddler. The old lady was desperate to give it to one of her nieces, so if I found it while cleaning, I was to return it to her immediately, all this over a dollar store toy. I was annoyed and she wouldn't shut up, so I made an excuse to go inside. After I said goodbye and shut the door behind me, I could hear her talking to me as if I was still standing there. Weird. A few days later, a truck comes to pick up the dumpster. My car was in the driveway, but I wasn't home to move it, resulting in the driver going over my lawn to reach the dumpster and leaving tire tracks. It's whatever, I don't care. Later in the day, the old lady's pounding on my door. She's furious and screaming that there's tire tracks on her lawn, but like I said before, it's not on her lawn, it's on mine. It's not even close to her property line. She insists it's her lawn, and I need to take care of the tracks ASAP. Okay, whatever, I'll fix it. Anything to get you to stop screaming and away from my front door. The next day I got to the house to find that she dug up the area where the track marks were. She planted grass seeds. Maybe she felt bad for yelling at me. I dismiss it. Although I do find it weird she's doing lawn work on property she doesn't even own. There are a few other small art encounters. And the fact that every time I stepped outside, she immediately comes out to try to engage with me. But I saved the weirdest for last. Like I said, I was living in the house my mom left. Specifically in an upstairs bedroom. I live alone. One morning, I come downstairs. I find an envelope on the first step right by the front door. There's a card inside, signed with the old lady's name. She writes how she's sorry about my mom. She also lost her mom at my age, and it made her feel connected to me, along with some other I'm here for you type of stuff. But I didn't put this card here. It was not here when I went upstairs to go to bed. The only explanation is she had come into my house at night while I was sleeping, and she left it on the stairs. Who knows what else she touched or did while inside of my house while I was asleep. I was very creeped out. I'm not going to confront her about coming into my house, but I will be avoiding her like the plague. I am moving into an apartment and will soon be rid of her. I am never leaving a door unlocked again. I was 20 at the time and ran a register at a very large super center. So large that we had four registers out in the garden section where I worked at the time. The fresh air and natural light made it far preferable to being inside. The customers were usually pretty friendly if you were polite. This is about one such customer. A friendly 30-year-old woman with a cart full of groceries. We made pleasant small talk and told each other a few jokes. Places to eat. Bad drivers we'd see. Basic shit. The lady behind her joined in and we had a nice, if nondescript, time. Then I scanned her last item and handed her her receipt. She let go of her cart, dropped her smile, and looked me deathly serious in the eyes and said, Remember, if you're ever in a place you don't want to be, draw a circle on the ground and step out of it, and you'll wake up some time else. And then she left. 
It was half warning, half common sense to her, like she was in the Truman Show where they say, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I'd like to add that I asked the other lady if she heard that too, to which she responded with a concern. She didn't say anything, which meant that there were zero witnesses to what she said. I asked a bunch of my friends, family, and co-workers if they'd ever heard something like that. Dead end. Whatever. The Google search or three later, and the closest thing I could find was an old Jewish belief about magic circles protecting you from demons. In that case, though, stepping out would be, you know, suicidal. The part that creeped me out more than anything else was how sharp of a turn it was. This woman went from being the ideal neighbor to straight up mad hatter on a dime. I don't know if you all find this creepy or not, but I've been kept up at night wondering just what the fuck that was all about and why the other lady didn't notice. It was a late August night. At the time, I was 17. My best friend and I ran cross country, so we would go for runs around our small suburban town at night. We lived across the town, so we would run to the track. The track is closed off from the town, basically like a college campus atmosphere. It's also right next to the swamps. That night, we had agreed on running to the bleachers to prepare for the season. We took a break from our run to the track, to sit and talk. Normal high school girl conversation. We're sitting on the bleachers and we hear leaves crinkling right below us. We immediately stopped talking at the same time. Something didn't seem right. We took note of it as we stared at each other and felt weird, but we decided to stop our break and start running the bleachers. I'm a paranoid person as I read all the stories on Reddit. And I also listen to Crime Junkie and other true crime podcasts. As we're running up and down, I'm looking down in between the bleachers. On our second time going up, I see a white-haired man standing under the bleachers, looking right at me. I immediately told my best friend to run, and we ran as fast as we could, out of the gates and back to the street. That was the last time we went running late at night on the track. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21, with a shitty job history, a shitty job, and shitty credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible, horrible situation. I was in a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady ass apartment complex, I actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in town is kind of a shade star. But for those of you not from here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town with more liquor stores than any other establishment and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot, and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed it, obviously missing, and died a bit as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Fuck, I thought to myself, and decided this was good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Driving home at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead in the road and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, 
and I saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. Holy shit. The kid saw me and jumped up, waving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I've made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I suddenly thought of all the warnings to young women about how serial killers and stuff would lure girls in by playing to their kind hearts. I locked the car doors but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They fucking left me. I need help, the kid said. He looked dazed and was scuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm going to call for help, okay? I grabbed at my cell phone and then remembered the damn thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone is broke, but I live nearby here, okay? I will get help. I hoped he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help. Now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline, and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's car parked in her spot and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person, and was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What's going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road, but my cell phone wasn't working. I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel and myself all got out of the car. Help, I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off, the kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? I asked. What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed wary of this change in story. Listen, man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid loses his shit. He screwed his face up and clenched his fists, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance and the police. And I can wait with you while they get here. But we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more. And then, in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. This sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the get the fuck out face. We jumped back into the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt, and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kid began stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house. Just let me get in the car. Why won't you take me home? Fuck you. Fuck you. The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, 
drove off, the kid grabbing frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our turn, around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike. The kid. Just gone. I have no idea where he took off to, but clumps of his hair were still in the road. We never saw that kid again. We searched the papers and the internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night. But nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about it all is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what the hell were his plans for all three of us? This happened to one of my best friends and I back in 2017, and I feel like it's worth sharing. For a bit of backstory, my best friend Elise was dating a guy named Mark in 2016. They broke up right as New Year's was approaching. I've known Elise for over a decade, but we didn't talk much while they were together. I ran into them once at a local coffee shop, hugged her and was chatting away while Mark stared at me in disgust as if Elise wasn't allowed to talk to her friends. At the time, I thought nothing of it, assuming he was just antisocial. I had no idea he would go on to ruin an entire year of my life. It's really fuzzy as to how Mark got in contact with me specifically. I believe Elise posted about her breakup, and I offered my support publicly. So he targeted me. It began on New Year's Eve. He started messaging me on Instagram over and over, threatening me. I was having a get-together with my then-boyfriend, two of my now ex-best friends, and now my ex-best friend's boyfriend. I remember seeing my notifications blowing up and ignoring it. Everyone else seemed more concerned than I was. I brushed it off until late the next day. I checked my phone and I had dozens of DMs from Mark as well as a few public posts that he targeted Elise and I in, calling us every name in the book, and claiming I was the reason they broke up. I answered his DMs, asking why he was targeting me. That was the biggest mistake I ever made. After some angry messages from him, he blocked me, and I thought it was over. I also had some missed calls from Elise, so I finally contacted her and asked her what was going on. She frantically told me that Mark was a dangerous man and that he's been tormenting her since the day they became a couple. He would throw her around his apartment, leaving awful bruises that she sent me photos of. He would threaten to end himself if she left him, and he even threw a hissy fit at the tattoo shop because they wouldn't tattoo Elise's first and middle name over his eyebrow. He got Crybaby instead. Fitting. Elise also informed me that Mark had went to jail before meeting her for domestic abuse. He stabbed his ex-girlfriend in the leg and was only behind bars for a month before his dad bailed him out. With this new information, I was terrified. Elise told me where he lived and it was directly behind the coffee shop I mentioned earlier. I frequented that building and that part of town in general. That'll come into play later. I eventually calmed myself down and forgot about it, until he got my phone number. I still don't know how he got it, but I woke up to 30 plus messages from him one day, and I was horrified. His messages included threats to kill himself if I didn't help him and Elise get back together, threats to kill me, cries for help, him blocking my number and then unblocking it just to start the cycle all over again. I being very naive and not wanting to be held responsible if he actually killed himself, did not block him. I asked him to leave me alone, and if he wanted a number to a hotline where he could get some help, he pretended to calm down for a bit. I gave him the number after many messages from him, saying how much he missed Elise, but also wanted to kill her. I told her immediately and pushed her to go to the police. She didn't. He conditioned her to believe that she would get into trouble if she reported him. This went on for months. 
I usually didn't respond, and when I did, he seemed to chill out for a bit. I'm skipping ahead to a particular night where Elise and I were hanging out at my house. We were chatting away when my phone started to light up. I ignored it and kept talking because I didn't want to be rude. Elise peeked at my phone and said, It's Mark, look. Sure enough, Mark was bombing my phone with threats to slit his own throat because he knew Elise was at my house. Calling us both names and claiming it would be our fault if he died that night. I didn't answer, but what came next is something that still haunts me to this day. He sent me a video. Being curious, I clicked on it, at least watching over my shoulder. It was a video of Mark's arm, a huge gash going down the middle. He was fake crying in the background, saying, You made me do this. I fucking hate you both. He clenched his fist over and over to make the blood gush out. Elise and I were so in shock that we watched the entire 50 second clip despite how disturbing it was. I immediately called our local police station. Elise gave them his address and an officer came to my house to view the video and then take some notes down. While we waited for the police to arrive, Mark posted the gruesome video to his Instagram and unblocked Elise and I just to tag us in it, claiming we told him to do it. Being a conventionally attractive guy with an e-boy aesthetic, the girls that swooned over him commented some pretty harsh things about us and kissed his ass like crazy. He was admitted to hospital that night, and I wish they kept him. The harassment continued the second he got out. I'll time travel a bit more now to a few months later. Mark hadn't let up, and Elise and I were still very close. We had a friend, Kayla, visiting from across the country. She also had a run-in online with Mark and hated him, but she wasn't afraid of him. She was always carrying more than one weapon, some pepper spray, and she knew how to fight, so she suggested we go take a walk in the part of town he lived in. She wanted to visit that coffee shop, see some of our small businesses, and then grab dinner at a pizzeria. But Lisa and I reluctantly agreed. We parked in front of the coffee shop, grabbed some drinks and started walking down the road. Within about five minutes, Mark drove by on his motorcycle. Elise and Kayla were immersed in conversation as I trailed behind. I looked up and made eye contact with Mark. Elise and Kayla noticed him too as he was speeding off. Kayla assured us he wouldn't get anywhere near us with her around, so we kept walking. Mark began circling the block we were on with his bike. As we crossed to the next block, he switched to that block and circled it too. On the third block was the pizzeria place. Their walls are all glass, all see-through of course. We went in and were seated in the corner, right next to the glass. We sat there for about an hour and a half, eating, talking, and sipping on soda. Mark circled the restaurant the entire time, and we did our best to ignore it. Once we were finished and got up to leave, Mark sped off and we didn't see him again that evening. Some time passed by and Mark began riding by Elise's house every night. Within a week, he started doing the same to me. I told my parents and my stepfather, who kept a close eye on our street. My mom always made sure our doors and windows were locked, shades were shut and all that stuff. Before going to bed, my dad would even do a nightly patrol where he would drive around my street for a few minutes on his way home from work since he no longer lived there. He would call me and let me know the coast was clear as he was leaving. I still woke up almost every night to the sound of his motorcycle engine revving outside of my house. We had no proof of this to show the police because he was somehow doing this without a trace so we didn't even bother reporting it. At the end of 2017, Mark took his motorcycle and sped off to California to avoid the legal trouble he'd gotten into here. Elise and I were relieved to say the least. He still harassed us from time to time, but he never came back. We stopped hearing from him after a while and we thought nothing of it. 
Fast forward one last time to September of 2019. Elise and I were out and about, enjoying the sunshine, when she got a phone call. Mark was dead. He had died right after his calls and messages to us stopped. He got into it with his new drug dealer in Arizona and pissed them off enough for them to shoot him. He died instantly. He also caught two more domestic violence charges in California and Arizona and was also on the run from his warrant. His father told everyone it was an accidental overdose because Mark was known for abusing Xanax and other miscellaneous drugs, but really, it was to cover up his sociopathic son's ass. I'm not sure if Mark's death was his karma or some higher being protecting us and all the girls he's hurt before and would hurt in the future, but he's gone. We never have to worry about our safety because of him ever again. Although, seeing photos of him does still give me the creeps. Mark, I don't know where you are, but this world is better off without people like you. I am so glad you're gone. So at the start of the year, we were introduced to our teachers. All of them were good teachers, except Miss A. So we went through classes, and in each one we got those cheesy beginning of the year introductions. It was quickly clear her class would not be normal health class, as evidenced by the fact that during her introduction, she went off about how terrible her divorced husband was. So classes started picking up and her insecurities somehow kept making it into lectures. One day, a few weeks into school, she just stopped showing up to class consistently. You know, her job. Now, at this point, everyone was cutting her some slack because she was a single mom, but it just got worse. We would have to do whole units from a workbook with improvised substitutes. This culminated when Miss C missed two weeks of school for no apparent reason. Most of the class could see her mental deterioration. Me and some friends in class started noticing some form of distress from Miss C. More and more stuff about her personal life would leak into lectures that she was there for. Suddenly it came to a head. She suddenly became distant and developed a tough shell around her. Miss C actually started coming to class consistently too. She started bringing her kids to class. I have a hunch she started doing this to help justify her inactions to her employers. One day she just sort of broke down in class about how horrible her husband was for not taking equal responsibility for their kids. It was a bad joke at this point. How long would Miss C last before being fired? Unluckily for us, it was too long. We just sort of endured lectures from this mentally unstable woman. Mind you, she was doing a fine job at suppressing traits associated with that around other school employees. One day we come in, and she wasn't in class. Breaking her streak of actually coming, we got our answer of how long she would last. A counselor walked into the room. Everyone knew what was up. She was gone. What had gone down exactly? She walked into her ex-husband's house on the Sunday before that class period. Her excuse to her ex was to deliver cold medication to her kids. After threatening to call the cops after a home invasion, she locked herself in the bathroom. She called the cops and unlocked the door to the bathroom. She then walked over to her coat, pulled out a gun, and opened fire on her ex's girlfriend, killing her. Mrs. C was then pinned until cops showed up. That wasn't her first offense either. Suspiciously close to the time when she hardly showed up to her job, she had several assault charges against her that she somehow managed to keep a secret from her job as a teacher. Weirdly enough, students who didn't have her as a teacher didn't take it seriously. It took less than 30 minutes after that that information was made public to the students in general for them to make a meme page about the incident. Weird how that worked. It got taken down.
It was the summer of 87 and I was four years old. I remember this like it happened yesterday. I used to live in a small town in southern Indiana in 87. The schools were shut for the summer break. Me and my cousin, who'd frequent us another city a hundred miles away, went out to play on scorching summer afternoons. We'd found this massive pile of construction sand at a nearby site where we'd spend most of the time making sandcastles and such. Right next to this massive pile of sand was a large water tank built with poured concrete and filled to the brim with water. Me and my cousin, when we'd be bored with the sand, would sometimes sit by this large tank and look at the tadpoles, which my older cousin convinced me were small fish. Neither of us could swim, and being cautious even at that age, never ventured too close to the tank. That day, for some reason I do not recall, my cousin had to head back to his home 100 miles away rather abruptly, cutting short his stay with us. I, being the only child, feeling lonely, with nothing else to do, decided to head to the construction sand pile. There was this other kid, a bit older than I was, who I'd never seen before. He was sitting by the water tank and chucking a piece of rope with a stick tied to one end into the water, and he would pull it back. I simply loved this toy he fashioned out of rope plus a stick. I asked him if I could join him. For sure, he said. He made up rules of a new game on the spot. You sit at the other end of the tank. I'll chuck the stick end of the rope at you, holding the rope end. If you manage to catch it, then you win your turn. If it hits the water, you'll lose a point. Deal? Who could say no to this? So yeah, we started this. Game. I think I caught it a few times. Some other times the stick landed in the water. He was losing, and he kept shortening the throws, so I had to keep reaching in for the stick. One fateful throw, I landed in the water. It was too sudden. I didn't realize what was happening. I was in the water, struggling to get out, trying to hold my breath and flailing my arms. Luckily, I managed to get hold of a rung on one of the corners of the tank, and I managed to climb out of it. The other kid was nowhere to be found. He came back about 20 minutes or so later. Oh, you managed to come out? I looked at him, fuming. Did you get lost? I remember asking him angrily. Oh, I just went to pee. He said, nonchalantly. I never thought you'd make it out. The water is deep. Did you not try to find grown-ups and tell them that I was drowning? He just shrugged. For a long time, I remembered this incident. Every detail. What I wore that day. Except something else came to light. Rather unexpectedly, years later, when I was talking about this with my dad. Yeah, I know. How would it have bothered you so much? feeling betrayed by your own cousin when you were drowning. Yeah, years later, I realized I had processed every bit of that incident and changed one crucial aspect in my head. There was no strange kid that day. It was my own cousin. My partner in crime every summer break that for some reason, only known to him, decided to let me drown or fend for myself. I got in a pretty bad fight with my boyfriend while I was staying at his house one night, and he asked me to leave. I drove around crying and finally settled on parking in this huge open parking lot in the front of the Dollar Tree to get my bearings. It was pretty late, around 2am, and there were a few cars in the lot. I chalked it up to people going to the 24-hour CVS nearby. I was crying pretty loud in my car for a few minutes until I heard tapping on my window. I stopped crying and looked up. A woman was gesturing for me to roll down my window. I froze and kept the window up, and she started signing and speaking to me. She told me to stop crying and keep my chin up. She said she could see I was in a lot of pain, and that she could understand pain because she's deaf. I found it kind of reassuring that she said God sent her to speak to me, 
and she was a heaven-sent angel. She told me to open my door and let her come in to talk to me. I'm not very religious and was really wary of her intentions. I got a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I locked my doors while she kept trying to convince me that God put her and I in that place at the time on purpose so she could help me. She kept pleading for me to open my door and I shook my head. I started my engine and peeled out there as fast as I could. I sped to my parents' house in the next town over and called my boyfriend. He met me and we reconciled. Since then, I have never told anyone the story because I felt like it was a bad move on my part to park in a terrible part of town in the middle of the night just to wallow. Later on, I remembered that my brother's friend got shot in his car in that parking lot a few years ago. Moral of the story, find a safe place to cry, friends. Hey guys, if you fancy checking out my Patreon, channel memberships, or social media, all my links are in the description below. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Christy, B Nick, Lil Smart, Do It, K, Something Edgy, Pretty Girl 215, Borderline Betty, Sarah C, Blazed Goddess, Christopher, Spider's Web, Ula La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kel, Monica Level Ace, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer L, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Jennifer C, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Sham, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are doing well. And on that note, 